This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Deborah Lynn in Northern Michigan, February 2007. Araminta and the Automobile by Charles Battelle Loomis Some persons spend their surplus on works of art. Some spend it on Italian gardens and pergolas. There are those who sink it in golf, and I have heard of those who expend it on charity. None of these forms of getting away with money appeal to Araminta and myself. As soon as it was ascertained that the automobile was practicable and would not cost a king's ransom, I determined to devote my savings to the purchase of one. Araminta and I lived in a suburban town. She, because she loves nature, and I, because I love Araminta. We have been married for five years. I am a bank clerk in New York, and morning and night I go through the monotony of railway travel, and for one who is forbidden to use his eyes on the train, and who does not play cards, it is monotony. For in the morning my friends are either playing cards or else reading their papers, and one does not like to urge the claims of conversation on one who is deep in politics, or the next play of his antagonist. So my getting to business and coming back are in the nature of purgatory. I therefore hailed the automobile as a heaven-sent means of swift motion, with an agreeable companion, and with no danger of encountering either newspapers or cards. I have seen neither reading nor card-playing going on in any automobile. The community in which I live is not progressive. And when I said that I expected to buy an automobile as soon as my ship came in, I was frowned upon by my neighbors. Several of them have horses, and all, or nearly all, have feet. The horsemen were not more opposed to my proposed ownership than the footmen. I should say pedestrians. They all thought automobiles dangerous and a menace to public peace. But, of course, I pooh-poohed their fears, and being a person of a good deal of stability of purpose, I went on saving my money, and in course of time I bought an automobile of the electric sort. Araminta is plucky, and I am perfectly fearless. When the automobile was brought home and housed in the little barn that is on our property, the man who had backed it in told me that he had orders to stay and show me how it worked, but I laughed at him. Good-naturedly, yet firmly, I said, Young man, experience teaches more in half an hour than books or precepts do in a year. A would-be newspaper man does not go to a school of journalism if he is wise. He gets a position on a newspaper and learns for himself and through his mistakes. I know that one of these levers is to steer by, that another lets loose the power, and that there is a foot-brake. I also know that the machine is charged, and I need to know no more. Good day. Thus did I speak to the young man, and he saw that I was a person of force and discretion, and he withdrew to the train, and I never saw him again. Araminta had been to Passaic shopping, but she came back while I was out in the barn looking at my new purchase, and she joined me there. I looked at her lovingly, and she returned the look. Our joint ambition was realized. We were the owners of an automobile, and we were going out that afternoon. Why is it that cheap barns are so flimsily built? I know that our barn is cheap, because the rent for house and barn is less than what many a clerk, city pent, pays for a cramped flat. But again I ask, why are they flimsily built? I have no complaint to make. If my barn had been built of good stout oak, I might today be in a hospital. It happened this way. Araminta said, Let me get in, and we will just take a little ride to see how it goes. And I, out of my love for her, said, Wait just a few minutes, dearest, until I get the hang of the thing. I want to see how much go she has, and just how she works. Araminta has learned to obey my slightest word, knowing that love is at the bottom of all my commands, and she stepped to one side while I entered the gaily painted vehicle and tried to move out of the barn. I moved out, but I backed. Oh, blessed, cheaply built barn! My way was not restricted to any appreciable extent. 
I shot gaily through the barn, into the hen-yard, and the sound of the ripping clapboards frightened the silly hens who were enjoying a dust-bath, and they fled in more directions than there were fowls. I had not intended entering the hen-yard, and I did not wish to stay there, so I kept on out, the wire netting not being what an automobile would call an obstruction. I never lose my head, and when I heard Araminta screaming in the barn, I called out cheerily to her, "'I'll be back in a minute, dear, but I'm coming another way.' And I did come another way. I came all sorts of ways. I really don't know what got into the machine, but she now turned to the left and made for the road, and then she ran along on her two left wheels for a moment, and then seemed about to turn a somersault but changed her mind, and, still veering to the left, kept on up the road, passing my house at a furious speed, and making for the open country.' With as much calmness as I could summon, I steered her, but I think I steered her a little too much, for she turned toward my house. I reached one end of the front piazza at the same time that Araminta reached the other end of it. I had the right of way, and she deferred to me just in time. I removed the vestibule storm door. It was late in March, and I did not think we should have any more use for it that season, and we didn't. I had ordered a strongly built machine, and I was now glad of it, because a light and weak affair that was merely meant to run along on a level and unobstructed road would not have stood the assault on my piazza. Why, my piazza did not stand it. It caved in, and made work for an already overworked local carpenter who was behindhand with his orders. After I had passed through the vestibule, I applied the brake, and it worked. The path is not a cinder one, as I think them untidy, so I was not more than muddied. I was up in an instant, and looked at the still enthusiastic machine with admiration. "'Have you got the hang of it?' said Araminta. "'Now that's one thing I like about Araminta. She does not waste words over non-essentials. The point was not that I had damaged the piazza. I needed a new one anyway.' main thing was that i was trying to get the hang of the machine and she recognized that fact instantly i told her that i thought i had and that if i had pushed the lever in the right way at first i should have come out of the barn in a more conventional way she again asked me to let her ride and as i now felt that i could better cope with the curves of the machine i allowed her to get in don't lose your head said i well, i hope i shan't said she dryly well, if you have occasion to leave me, drop over the back. Never jump ahead. That is a fundamental rule in runaways of all kinds. Then we started, and I ran the motor along for upward of half a mile, after I had reached the highway, which I did by a short cut through a field at the side of our house. There is only a slight rail fence surrounding it, and my machine made little of that. It really seemed to delight in what some people would have called danger. Araminta, are you glad that I saved up for this? I am mad with joy, said the dear thing, her face flushed with excitement mixed with expectancy. Nor were her expectations to be disappointed. We still had a good deal to do before we should have ended our first ride. So far I had damaged property to a certain extent, but I had no one but myself to reckon with, and I was providing work for people. I always have claimed that he who makes work for two men, where there was only work for one before, is a public benefactor, and that day I was the friend of carpenters and other mechanics. Along the highway we flew, our hearts beating high, but never in our mouths, and at last we saw a team approaching us. By a team I mean a horse and buggy. I was raised in Connecticut, where a team is anything you choose to call one. The teamster saw us. Well, perhaps I should not call him a teamster, although he was one logically. He was our doctor, and as I say, he saw us. Now, I think it would have been friendly in him, seeing that I was more or less of a novice at the art of automobiling, to have turned to the left when he saw that I was inadvertently turning to the left. But the practice of forty years, added to a certain native obstinacy, made him turn to the right, and he met me at the same time that I met him. The horse was not hurt, for which I am truly glad, and the doctor joined us and continued with us for a season, but his buggy was demolished. Of course, I am always prepared to pay for my pleasure, 
and though it was not, strictly speaking, my pleasure to deprive my physician of his turnout, yet, if he had turned out, it wouldn't have happened, and, as I say, I was prepared to get him a new vehicle. But he was very unreasonable, so much so that, as he was crowding us, for the seat was not built for more than two, and he is stout, I at last told him that I intended to turn around and carry him home as we were out for pleasure, and he was giving us pain. I will confess that the events of the last few minutes had rattled me somewhat, and I did not feel like turning just then, as the road was narrow. I knew that the road turned of its own accord a half mile further on, and so I determined to wait. "'I want to get out,' said the doctor tartly, and just as he said so, Araminta stepped on the brake accidentally. The doctor got out, in front. With great presence of mind I reversed, and so we did not run over him. But he was furious and sulfurous, and that is why I have changed to homeopathy. He was the only allopathic doctor in Brantford. I suppose that if I had stopped and apologized, he would have made up with me, and I would not have got angry with him, but I couldn't stop. The machine was now going as she had done when I left the barn, and we were backing into town. Through it all I did not lose my coolness. I said, Araminta, look out behind, which is ahead of us, and if you have occasion to jump now, do it in front, which is behind. And Araminta understood me. She sat sideways so that she could see what was going on, but that might have been seen from any point of view, for we were the only things going on, or backing. Pretty soon we passed the wreck of the buggy, and then we saw the horse grazing on dead grass by the roadside, and at last we came on a few of our town folk who had seen us start, and were now come out to welcome us home. But I did not go home just then. I should have done so, if the machine had minded me and turned in at our driveway, but it did not. Across the way from us there is a fine lawn leading up to a beautiful greenhouse full of rare orchids and other plants. It is the pride of my very good neighbor Jacob Rawlinson. The machine, as if moved by malice prepense, turned just as we came to the lawn and began to back at railroad speed. I told Araminta that if she was tired of riding, now was the best time to stop, that she ought not to overdo it, and that I was going to get out myself as soon as I had seen her off. I saw her off. Then, after one ineffectual jab at the brake, I left the machine hurriedly, and as I sat down on the sposhy lawn, I heard a tremendous but not unmusical sound of falling glass. I tell Araminta that it isn't the running of an automobile that is expensive. It is the stopping of it. End of Araminta and the Automobile This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Larry Long l c l o n g j r at hotmail dot com crossroads of destiny by h beam piper i still have the dollar bill it's in my box at the bank and i think that's where it will stay i simply won't destroy it but i can think of nobody to whom i'd be willing to show it certainly nobody at the college my history department colleagues least of all merely to tell the story would brand me irredeemably as a crackpot but crackpots are tolerated even on college faculties it's only when they begin producing physical evidence that they get themselves actively resented i went into the club car for a nightcap before going back to my compartment to turn in there were five men there sitting together one was an army officer with the insignia and badges of a staff intelligence colonel next to him was a man of about my own age with sandy hair and a bony scottish-looking face who sat staring silently into a highball which he held in both hands across the aisle an elderly man who could have been a lawyer or a banker was smoking a cigar over a glass of port and beside him sat a plump and slightly too well groomed individual who had a tall colorless drink probably gin and tonic the fifth man separated from him by a vacant chair seemed to be dividing his attention between a book on his lap and the conversation in which he was taking no part i sat beside the sandy-haired man as i did so and rang for the waiter the colonel was saying no that wouldn't i can think of a better one suppose you have columbus get his ships from henry the seventh of england and sail under the english flag instead of the spanish flag you know 
He did try to get English backing before he went to Spain, but King Henry turned him down. That could be changed. I pricked up my ears. The period from 1492 to the Revolution is my special field of American history, and I knew at once the enormous difference it would have made. It was a moment later that I realized how oddly the colonel had expressed the idea, and by that time the plump man was speaking. Yes, that would work, he agreed. Those kings made decisions, most of the time, on whether or not they had a hangover, or what some court favorite thought. He got out a notebook and a pen and scribbled briefly. I'll hand that to the planning staff when I get to New York. That's Henry the Seventh, not Henry the Eighth, right? We'll fix it so that Columbus will catch him when he's in a good humor. Well, that was too much. I turned to the man beside me. What goes on, I asked. Has someone invented a time machine? He looked up from the drink he was contemplating and gave me a grin. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Why, no. Our friend here is getting up a television program. Tell the gentleman about it, he urged the plump man across the aisle. The waiter arrived at that moment. The plump man, who seemed to need little urging, waited until he had ordered a drink and then began telling me what a positively sensational idea it was. We're calling it Crossroads of Destiny. It'll be a series, one half-hour shows a week. In each episode, we'll take some historic event and show how history could have been changed if something had happened differently. We dramatize the event up to that point just as it really happened, and then a commentary voice comes on and announces that this is the crossroads of destiny. This is where history could have been completely changed. Then he gives a resume of what really did happen, and then he says, but suppose so-and-so had done this and that instead of such and such, then we pick up the dramatization at that point, only we show it the way it might have happened. Like this thing about Columbus, we'll show how it could have happened and end with Columbus wading ashore with his sword in one hand and a flag on the other, just like in the painting, only it'll be the English flag, and Columbus will shout, I take possession of this new land in the name of His Majesty Henry the Seventh of England. He brandished his drink to the visible consternation of the elderly man beside him, and then the sailors all sing, God Save the King which wasn't written until about 1745, I couldn't help mentioning. Huh? The plump man looked startled. Are, are you sure? Then he decided that I was and shrugged. Well, they can shout, God save King Henry, or St. George of for England, or something. Then, at the end, we introduce the program guest, some history expert, a real name, and he tells how he thinks history would have been changed if it had happened this way. The conservatively just gentleman beside him wanted to know how long he expected to keep the show running. The crossroads will give out before long, he added. The sponsor will give out first, I said. History is just one damn crossroads after another. I mentioned in passing that I taught the subject. Why, since the beginning of this century, we've had enough of them to keep the show running for a year. We have about twenty already written and ready to produce, the plump man said comfortably, and ideas for twice as many that the planning staff is now working on. The elderly man accepted that and took another cautious sip of wine. What, I wonder, though, is whether you can really say that history can be changed. Well, of course, the television man was taken aback. One always seems to be when a basic assumption is questioned. Of course, we only know what really did happen, but it stands to reason if something had happened differently, those results would have been different, doesn't it? But it seems to me that everything would work out the same in the long run. There'd be some differences at the time, but... Over the years, wouldn't they all cancel out? Non, non, monsieur, the man with the book, who had been outside the conversation until now, told him earnestly, make no mistake, history can be changed. I looked at him curiously. The accent sounded French, but it wasn't quite right. He was some kind of a foreigner, though. I'd swear that he never bought the clothes he was wearing in this country. The way the suit fitted, and the cut of it, and the shirt collar, and the necktie. The book he was reading was Langmuir's Social History of the American People. Not one of my favorites, a bit too much on the doctrinaire side, but what a bookshop clerk would give a foreigner looking for something to explain America. What do you think, Professor? The plump man was asking me. It would work out the other way. The differences wouldn't cancel out, they'd accumulate. Say something happened a century ago to throw a presidential election the other way. You'd get different people at the head of the government, opposite lines of policy taken, and eventually, we'd be getting into different wars with different enemies at different times, and different batches of young men killed before they could marry and have families. Different people being born or not being born, that would mean different ideas, good or bad, being advanced. Different books written, different inventions, and different social and economic problems as a consequence. Look, he's only giving himself a century, the colonel added. 
Think of the changes if this thing we were discussing, Columbus, sailing under the English flag, had happened. Or, suppose Leif Erikson had been able to plant a permanent colony in America in the 11th century. Or, if the Saracens had won the Battle of Tours. Try to imagine the world today if any of those things had happened. One thing you can be sure of, any errors you make in trying to imagine such a world would be on the side of over-conservatism. The sandy-haired man beside me, who had been using his highball for a crystal ball, must have glimpsed in it what he was looking for. He finished the drink, set the empty glass on the stand tray beside him, and reached back to push the button. I don't think you realize just how good an idea you have here, he told the plump man abruptly. If you did, you wouldn't ruin it with such timid and unimaginative treatment. I thought he'd been staying out of the conversation because it was over his head. Instead, he had been taking the plump man's idea apart examining all the pieces and considering what was wrong with it and how it could be improved. The plump man looked startled, then angry. Timid and unimaginative were the last things he'd expected his idea to be called. Then he became uneasy. Maybe this fellow was a typical representative of his lord and master, the faceless abstraction called the public. What do you mean, he asked. Misplaced emphasis. You shouldn't emphasize the event that could have changed history. You should emphasize the changes that could have been made. You're going to end this show you were talking about with a shot of Columbus wading up to the beach with an English flag, aren't you? Well, that's the logical ending. That's the logical beginning, the sandy-haired man contradicted. After that, your guest historian comes on. How much time will he be allowed? Well, maybe three or four minutes. We can't cut the dramatization too short. And he'll have to explain a couple of times, and in words of one syllable, that what we have seen didn't really happen. Because if he doesn't, the next morning, half the 12-year-old kids in the country will be rushing wild-eyed into school to slip the teacher the real insight about the discovery of America. By the time he gets that done, he'll be able to mumble a couple of generalities about vast and incalculable effects, and then it'll be time for, to tell the public about widgets, the really safe cigarettes, all filter and absolutely free from tobacco. The waiter arrived at this point, and the sandy-haired man ordered another rye highball. I decided to have another bourbon on the rocks, and the TV impresario said gin and tonic absently and went into a reverie which lasted until the drinks arrived. Then he came awake again. I see what you mean, he said. Most of the audience would wonder what difference it would have made where Columbus would have gotten his ships, as long as he got them and America got discovered. I can see it would have made a hell of a big difference, but how could it be handled any other way? How could you figure out just what the difference would have been? Well, you need a man who'd know the historical background, and you need a man with a powerful creative imagination, who is used to using it inside rigorously defined limits. Don't try to get them both in one. A collaboration would really be better. Then you work from the known situation in Europe and in America in 1492 and decide on the immediate effects. And from that, you have to carry it along step by step down to the present. It would be a lot of hard and very exacting work, but the result would be worth it. He took a sip from his glass and added, Remember, you don't have to prove that the world today would be the way you set it up. All you have to do is make sure that nobody else would be able to prove that it wouldn't. Well, how could you present that? As a play, with fictional characters and a plot, time, the present, under the changed conditions, the plot, the reason the coward conquers his fear and becomes a hero, the obstacle to the boy marrying the girl, the reason the innocent man is being persecuted, will have to grow out of this imaginary world you've constructed and be impossible in our real world. As long as you stick to that, you're all right. Sure, I get that. The plump man was excited again. He was about half sold on the idea. But how will we get the audience to accept it? We're asking them to start with an assumption they know isn't true. Maybe it is in another time dimension, the colonel suggested. You can't prove it isn't. And for that matter, you can't prove there aren't other time dimensions. Huh, that's it, the sandy-haired man exclaimed. World of alternate probability. That takes care of that. He drank about a third of his highball and sat gazing into the rest of it in an almost yogic trance. The plump man looked at the colonel in bafflement. Well, maybe this alternate probability time dimension stuff means something to you, he said. Be damned if it does to me. Well... As far as we know, we live in a four-dimensional universe, the colonel started. The elderly man across from him groaned. Fourth dimension. Good God, what are we going to talk about? Well, it isn't anything to be scared of. You carry an instrument for measuring in the fourth dimension all the time. A watch. You mean it's just time? But that isn't. We know of three dimensions in space, the colonel told him, gesturing to indicate them. We can use them for coordinates to locate things, but we also locate things in time. 
I wouldn't like to ride in a train or a plane if we didn't. Well, let's call the time we know, the time your watch registers, time A. Now suppose the entire infinite extent of time A is only an instant in another dimension of time, which we'll call time B. The next instant of time B is also the entire extent of time A, and the next and the next. As in time A, different things are happening at different instants. In one of these instances of time B, one of the things that's happening is that Henry the Seventh of England is furnishing ships to Christopher Columbus. The man with the odd clothes was getting excited again. These, uh, how you say, these alternate probability, it is a zero generally accepted in, in this country? Got it, the sandy-haired man said before anybody could answer. He set his drink on the stand tray and took a big jackknife out of his pocket, holding it unopened in his hand. How's this sound, he said. He hit the edge of the tray with the back of the knife. Bong! The crossroads of destiny, he intoned, and hit the edge of the tray again. Bong! This is the year 1959, but not the 1959 of our world, for we are in a world of alternate probability, in another dimension of time, a world parallel to and coexistent with but separate from our own, in which history has been completely altered by a single momentous event. He shifted back to his normal voice. Not bad. Only 25 seconds, the plump man said, looking up from his wristwatch, and a trained announcer could maybe shave five seconds off that. Yes, something like that, and at the end we'll have another 30 seconds, and we can do without the guest. But this alternate probability in another dimension, the stranger was insisting, is the concept original with you? He asked the colonel. Oh no, that idea has been around for a long time. I never heard of it before now, the elderly man said, as though that completely demolished it. Then it is generally accepted by the scientists? Um, no, the sandy-haired man relieved the colonel. There's absolutely no evidence to support it, and scientists don't accept unsupported assumptions unless they need them to explain something, and they don't need this assumption for anything. Well, it would come in handy to make some of these reports of freak phenomena, like mysterious appearances and disappearances, or flying object sightings or reported falls of non-meteoric matter, theoretically respectable. Reports like that usually get the ignore and forget treatment now. Then you believe that these other world of the alternate probabilities they exist? No, I don't disbelieve it either. I've no reason to, one way or another. He studied his drink for a moment and lowered the level of the glass slightly. I've said that once in a while things get reported that look as though such other worlds in another time dimension may exist. There have been whole books published by people who collect stories like that. I must say that academic science isn't very hospitable to them. You mean zings sometimes, how you say, leak in from one of these other worlds? That has been known to happen? Things have been said to have happened that might, if true, be cases of things leaking through from another time world, the sandy-haired man corrected, or leaking away to another time world. He mentioned a few of the more famous cases of unexplained mysteries. The English diplomat in Prussia who vanished in plain sight of a number of people. The ship found completely deserted by her crew. The lifeboats all in place. Stories like that. And there's this rash of alleged sightings of unidentified flying objects. I'd sooner believe they came from another dimension than from another planet. But, as far as I know, nobody seriously advanced this other time dimension theory to explain them. I think the idea is familiar enough, though, that we can use it as an explanation or pseudo-explanation for the program, the television man said. Fact is, we aren't married to this Crossroads title yet. We could just as easily call it Fifth Dimension. That would lead the public to expect something out of the normal before the show started. That got the conversation back onto the show, and we talked f for some time about it, each of us suggesting possibilities. The stranger even suggested one, that the Civil War had started during the Jackson administration. Fortunately. No one else noticed that. Finally, a porter came through and inquired if any of us were getting off at Harrisburg, saying that we would be getting in in five minutes. The stranger finished his drink hastily and got up, saying that he would have to get his luggage. He told us how much he had enjoyed the conversation and then followed the porter towards the rear of the train. After he got out, the TV man chuckled. Was that one an oddball, he exclaimed. Where the hell do you suppose he got that suit? It was a tailored suit, the colonel said. A very good one. And I can't think of a country in the world in which they cut suits just like that. Did you catch his accent? Phony, the television man pronounced. A French accent of a German waiter 
in a fake French restaurant in the Bronx. Well, not quite. The pronunciation was all right for French accent, but the cadence, the way the word sounds were strung together, was German. The elderly man looked at the colonel keenly. I see your intelligence, he mentioned. Think he might be somebody up your alley, colonel? Colonel shook his head. I doubt it. There are agents of unfriendly powers in this country. A lot of them, I'm sorry to have to say. But they don't speak accent in English, and they don't dress eccentrically. You know there's an enemy agent in the crowd. Pick out the most normally American type in sight, and you usually don't have to look further. The train ground to a stop. A young couple with hand luggage came in and sat on one end of the car, waiting until other accommodations could be found for them. After a while, it started again. I dallied over my drink and then got up and excused myself, saying that I wanted to turn in early. In the next car behind, I met the porter who had come in just before the stop. He looked worried, and after a moment's hesitation, he spoke to me. Pardon, sir. The man in the club car who got off at Harrisburg, did you know him? Never saw him before. Why? He tipped me with a dollar bill when he got off. Later, I looked at it closely. I do not like it. He showed it to me, and I didn't blame him. It was marked one dollar in United States of America, but outside that, there wasn't a thing right about it. One side was gray, all right, but the other side was green. The picture wasn't the right one, and there were a lot of other things about it, some of them absolutely ludicrous. It wasn't counterfeit. It wasn't any, even an imitation of the United States bill. And then it hit me, like a bullet in the chest, not a bill of our United States. No wonder he had been so interested in whether our scientists accepted the theory of other time dimensions and other worlds of alternate probability. On an impulse, I got out two notes and gave them to the porter. Perfectly good United States gold certificates. You'd better let me keep this, I said, trying to make it sound the way he'd think a federal agent would say it. He took the bill, smiling, and I folded his bill and put it in my vest pocket. Thank you, sir, he said. I have no wish to keep it. Some part of my mind below the level of consciousness must have taken over and guided me to the right car and compartment. I didn't realize where I was going until I put on the light and recognized my own luggage. Then I sat down, as dizzy as though the two drinks I had 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 been a dozen. For a moment, I was tempted to rush back to the club car and show the thing to the colonel and the sandy-haired man. On second thought, I decided against that. The next thing I banished from my mind was the adjective incredible. I had to credit it. I had the proof in my vest pocket. The coincidence arising from our topic of conversation didn't bother me too much either. It was the topic which had drawn him into it, and, as the sandy-haired man had pointed out, we know nothing, one way or another, about these other worlds. We certainly don't know what barriers separate them from our own, or how often these barriers may fail. I might have thought more about it if I'd been in physical science. I wasn't. I was in American history, so what I thought about was what sort of country that other United States must be, and what its history must have been. The man's costume was basically the same as ours, same general style, but many little differences in fashion. I had the impression that it was a costume of a less formal and conservative society than ours, and a more casual way of life. It could be the sort of costume into which ours would evolve in another thirty or so years. There was another th odd thing. I'd noticed him looking curiously at both the waiter and the porter as though something about them surprised him. The only thing they had in common was their race, the same as every other passenger car attendant, but he wasn't used to seeing Chinese working the railway cars. And there had been that remark about the Civil War and the Jackson administration. I wondered what Jackson he had been talking about. Not Andrew Jackson, the Tennessee militia general who got us into the war with Spain in 1810, I hope, and the Civil War, that had me baffled completely. I wondered if it had been a class war or a sectional conflict. We'd had plenty of the latter during the first century, but all of them had been settled peacefully and constitutionally. Well, some of the things he'd read in Ling Moyer's social history would be surprises for him, too. And then I took the bill out for another examination. It must have gotten mixed in with his spendable money. It was about the size of ours, and I wondered how he had acquired enough of our money to pay his train fare. Maybe he'd had a diamond and sold it, or maybe he'd had a gun and held somebody up. If he had, I don't know that I blamed him under the circumstances. I had an idea that he had some realization of what had happened to him, the book and the fake accent, to cover any mistakes he might make. Well, I wished him luck and then unfolded the dollar bill and looked at it again. In the first place, it had been issued by the United States Department of Treasury itself, not the United States Bank or one of the state banks. I'd have to think over the implications of that carefully. In the second place, it was a silver certificate. Why, in this other United States, silver must be an acceptable monetary metal, maybe equally so with gold. 
though I could hardly believe that. Then I looked at the picture on the gray obverse side and had to strain my eyes on the fine print under it to identify it. It was Washington, all right, but a much older Washington than any of the pictures of him I had ever seen. Then I realized I knew just where the crossroads of destiny for this world and mine had been. As every schoolchild among us knows, General George Washington was shot dead at the Battle of Germantown in 1777 by an English, or rather Scottish, officer, Patrick Ferguson. The same Patrick Ferguson that invented the breech-loading rifle that smashed Napoleon's armies. Washington, today, is one of our lesser national heroes because he was our first military commander-in-chief. But in this other world, he must have survived to lead our armies to victory and become the, our first president, as was the case with the man who took his place when he was killed. I folded the bill and put it carefully among my identification cards, where it wouldn't a second time get mixed in with the money I spent. And as I did, I wondered what sort of a president George Washington had made and what part in the history of that other United States had been played by the man whose picture appears on our dollar bill, General and President Benedict Arnold. The End this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to have a volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn in February 2007. Grandma Keeler Gets Grandpa Ready for Sunday School by Sarah P. McLean Green. Sunday morning nothing arose in Wallencamp save the sun. At least that celestial orb had long forgotten all the roseate flaming of his youth in an honest straightforward march through the heavens ere the first signs of smoke came curling lazily up from the Wallencamp chimneys. I had retired at night very weary, with the delicious consciousness that it wouldn't make any difference when I woke up the next morning, or whether indeed I woke at all. So I opened my eyes leisurely and lay half dreaming, half meditating on a variety of things. I deciphered a few of the texts on the scriptural patchwork quilt which covered my couch. There were, Let not your heart be troubled, Remember Lot's wife, and Philander Keeler, traced in inky hieroglyphics all in close conjunction. Finally I reached out for my watch, and having ascertained the time of day, I got up and proceeded to dress hastily enough, wondering to hear no signs of life in the house. I went noiselessly down the stairs. All was silent below, except for the peaceful snoring of Mrs. Philander and the little Keelers, which was responded to from some remote western corner of the ark by the triumphant snores of Grandma and Grandpa Keeler. I attempted to kindle a fire in the stove, but it sizzled a little while, spitefully, as much as to say, What, Sunday morning? Not I! and went out. So I concluded to put on some wraps and go out and warm myself in the sun. I climbed the long hill back of the ark, descended, and walked along the bank of the river. It was a beautiful morning. The air was everything that could be desired in the way of air, but I felt a desperate need of something more substantial. Standing alone with nature on the bank of the lovely river, I thought, with tears in my eyes, of the delicious breakfast already recuperating the exhausted energies of my faraway home friends. When I got back to the house, Mrs. Philander, in simple and unaffected attire, was bustling busily about the stove. The snores from Grandma and Grandpa's quarter had ceased, signifying that they also had advanced a stage in the grand processes of Sunday morning. The children came teasing me to dress them, so I fastened for them a variety of small articles, which I flattered myself on having combined in a very ingenious and artistic manner, though I believe those infant keelers went weeping to Grandma afterward and were remodeled by her all-comforting hand with much skill and patience. In the midst of her preparations for breakfast, Madeline abruptly assumed her hat and shawl and was seen from the window walking leisurely across the field in the direction of the woods. She returned in due time, bearing an armful of fresh evergreens, which she twisted around the family register. When the ancient couple made their appearance, I remarked silently in regard to Grandma Keeler's hair what proved afterward to be its usual holiday morning arrangement. It was confined in six infinitesimal braids, which appeared to be sprouting out perpendicularly in all directions from her head. 
The effect of redundancy and expansiveness thus heightened and increased on Grandma's features was striking in the extreme. While we were eating breakfast, that good soul observed to Grandpa Keeler, "'Wall, Pa, I suppose you'll be ready when the time comes to take Teacher and me over to West Wallen to Sunday school, won't you?' Grandpa coughed and coughed again and raised his eyes helplessly to the window. "'Looks some like showers,' said he. "'Ahem, <clears throat> looks mildly to me like showers over yonder.' "'Thou really, husband, I must say I feel mortified for you.' said Grandma, seeing as you're a professor, too, and there ain't been a single Sunday morning since I've lived with you, Pa, summer or winter, but what you've seen showers, and it really seems to me it's dreadful inconsistent when there ain't no cloud in the sky and don't look no more like rain than I do. And Grandma's face, in spite of her reproachful tones, was, above all, blandly sunlike and expressive of anything rather than deluge and watery disaster. Grandpa was silent a little while, then coughed again. I had never seen Grandpa in worse straits. <clears throat> <clears throat> Fanny seems to be a little lame this morning, said he. I shouldn't wonder. She's been going pretty stiddy this week. It does beat all, Pa, continued Grandma Keeler, how to all the horses you've ever had since I've known you have always been took lame on Sunday morning. There was Happy Jack... He could go anywheres through the week and never limp a step as nobody could see. And Sunday morning he was always took lame. And there was Tantrum. Tantrum was the horse that had run away with Grandma when she was thrown from the wagon and generally smashed to pieces. And now Grandma branched off into the thrilling reminiscences connected with this incident of her life, which was the third time during the week that the horrible tale had been repeated for my delectation. When she had finished, Grandpa shook his head with painful earnestness, reverting to the former subject of discussion. "'It's a long jaunt,' said he, "'a long jaunt. "'There's a long hill to climb before we reach Zion's Mount,' said Grandma Keeler impressively. "'Wall, there's a darn sight harder one on the road to West Wallen,' burst out the old sea captain desperately. "'Say nothing about the devilish stones.' "'Thar now,' said Grandma, with calm, though awful reproof. "'I think we've gone fur enough for one day. "'We've broke the Sabbath and took the name of the Lord in vain, "'and that ought to be enough for professors.' "'Grandpa replied at length in a greatly subdued tone. "'Wall, if you and the teacher want to go over to Sunday school today, "'I suppose we can go if we get ready.' "'A long, submissive sigh. "'I suppose we can.' "'They have preaching service in the morning, I suppose,' said Grandma. "'But we don't generally get along to that. It makes such an early start. "'We generally try to get around when we go in time for Sunday school. "'They have singing and all. "'It's just about as interesting, I think, as preaching.' "'The old man really likes it,' she observed aside to me, "'when he wants to get started, but he kind of dreads the getting started.' When I beheld the ordeal through which Grandpa Keeler was called to pass at the hands of his faithful consort, before he was considered in a fit condition of mind and body to embark for the sanctuary, I marveled not at the old man's reluctance, nor that he had indeed seen clouds and tempests fringing the horizon. Immediately after breakfast he set out for the barn, ostensibly to see to the chores, really, I believe, to obtain a few moments' respite before worse evil should come upon him. Pretty soon Grandma was at the back door, calling in firm though persuasive tones, "'Husband! Husband! Come in now and get ready!' No answer. Then it was in another key, weighty, yet expressive of no weak irritation, that Grandma called, "'Come, Pa! Pa! Pa!' Still no answer. But then that voice of Grandma sung out like a trumpet, terrible with meaning. "'By Jonah Keeler!' But Grandpa appeared not. Next I saw Grandma slowly but surely gravitating in the direction of the barn, and soon she returned, bringing with her that ancient delinquent who looked like a lost sheep indeed, and a truly unreconciled one. "'Now the first thing,' said Grandma, looking her forlorn captive over, "'is boots.' Go and get on your meetin' gaiters, Pa. The old gentleman, 
having dutifully invested himself with those sacred relics, came pathetically limping into the room. "'I declare, Ma,' said he, "'somehow these things, phew, somehow they pinch my feet dreadfully. I don't know what it is, phew, they're dreadful uncomfortable things somehow.' "'Since I've known you, Pa,' solemnly ejaculated Grandma Keeler, "'you've never had a pair of meetin' boots that set easy on your feet. "'You'd ought to get boots big enough for you, Pa,' she continued, "'looking down disapprovingly on the old gentleman's pedal extremities, "'which resembled two small scows at anchor in black cloth encasements, "'and not be so proud as to go to pinchin' your feet into gaiters "'a number of sizes too small for you.' "'They're number tens, I tell you,' roared Grandpa, nettled outrageously by this cutting taunt. "'Well, there now, Pa,' said Grandma soothingly. "'If I had such feet as that, I wouldn't go to spreadin' it all over town, if I was you. "'But it's time we stop bickerin' now, husband, and got ready for meetin'. "'So sit down and let me wash your head.' "'I've washed once this morning. It's clean enough,' Grandpa protested, but in vain.' He was planted in a chair, and Grandma Keeler, with rag and soap and a basin of water, attacked the old gentleman vigorously, much as I have seen cruel mothers wash the faces of their earth-begrimed infants. He only gave expression to such groans as, "'Thar, Ma, don't tear my ears to pieces. Come, Ma, you got my eyes so full of soap now, Ma, that I can't see nothing. Phew, Lordy, ain't she most through with this, Ma?' Then came the dyeing process, which Grandma Keeler assured me aside made Grandpa look like a man of thirty. But to me, after it, he looked neither old nor young, human nor inhuman, nor like anything that I had ever seen before under the sun. "'There's the lotion, the potion, the dyer, and the setter,' said Grandma, pointing to four bottles on the table. "'Now, where's the directions, Madeline?' These having been produced from between the leaves of the family Bible, Madeline read, while Grandma made a vigorous practical application of the various mixtures. This admirable lotion, in soft ecstatic tones, Madeline rehearsed the flowery language of the recipe, though not so instantaneously startling in its effect as our inestimable dyer and setter, yet forms the most essential part of the whole process, opening, as it does, the dry and lifeless pores of the scalp, imparting to them new life and beauty, and rendering them more easily susceptible to the applications which follow. But we must go deeper than this. A tone must be given to the whole system by means of the cleansing and rejuvenating of the very centre of our beings, and for this purpose we have prepared our wonderful potion. Here Grandpa, with a wry face, was made to swallow a spoonful of the mixture. "'Our unparalleled dyer,' Madeline continued, "'restores black hair to a more than original gloss and brilliancy, "'and gives to the faded golden tress the sunny flashes of youth. "'Grandpa was dyed. "'Our world-renowned setter completes and perfects the whole process "'by adding tone and permanency to the efficacious qualities "'of the lotion, potion, and dyer, etc., "'while on Grandpa's head the unutterable dye was set.' "'Now read teacher some of the testimonials, daughter,' said Grandma Keeler, whose face was one broad, generous illustration of that rare and peculiar virtue called faith. So Madeline continued, "'Mrs. Hiram Briggs of North Dedham writes, "'I was terribly afflicted with baldness, "'so that for months I was little more than an outcast from society "'and an object of pity to my most familiar friends. "'I tried every remedy in vain.' At length I heard of your wonderful restorative. After a week's application, my hair had already begun to grow in what seemed the most miraculous manner. At the end of ten months it had assumed such length and proportions as to be a most luxurious burden, and where I had before been regarded with pity and aversion, I became the envied and admired of all beholders. Just think, said Grandma Keeler, with rapturous sympathy and gratitude, how that poor creature must have felt. Orion Spaulding of Weedsville, Vermont, Madeline went on, but here I had to beg to be excused and went to my room to get ready for the Sunday school. When I came down again, Grandpa Keeler was seated, completely arrayed in his best clothes, opposite Grandma, who held the big family Bible in her lap and a Sunday school question book in one hand. Now, Pa, said she, what tribe was it in sacred writ that wore bonnets? 
I was compelled to infer, from the tone of Grandpa Keeler's answer, that his temper had not undergone a mollifying process during my absence. "'Come, Ma,' said he, "'how much longer are you going to pester me in this way?' "'Why, Pa,' Grandma rejoined calmly, "'until you get a proper understanding of it. "'What tribe was it in sacred writ that wore bonnets?' "'Lordy!' exclaimed the old man. "'How do you suppose I know? "'It must have been a tarnal old womanish-looking set anyway.' "'The tribe of Judah, Pa,' said Grandma gravely. "'Now how good it is, husband, "'to have your understanding all freshened up on the scriptures.' "'Come, come, Ma,' said Grandpa, rising nervously. "'It's time we was starting. "'When I make up my mind to go anywhere, "'I always want to get there in time. "'If I was going to the old Harry, "'I should want to get there in time.' "'It's my concern that we shall all get thar before time. "'Some on us,' said Grandma, with sad meaning, "'unless we learn to use more respectful language. "'I shall never forget how we set off for church that Sabbath morning, "'way out at one of the sunny back doors of the ark, "'for there was Madeline's little cottage that fronted the highway, or lane, "'and then there was a long backward extension of the ark, "'only one story in height.' This belonged peculiarly to Grandma and Grandpa Keeler. It contained the parlor and three keepin' rooms, opening one into the other, all of the same size and general bare and gloomy appearance, all possessing the same sacredly preserved atmosphere, through which we passed with becoming silence and solemnity into the end room, the sunny kitchen where Grandma and Grandpa kept house by themselves in the summer time and there at the door, her very yellow coat reflecting the rays of the sun, stood Fanny, presenting about as much appearance of life and animation as a pensive summer squash. The carriage, I thought, was a facsimile of the one in which I had been brought from West Wallen on the night of my arrival. One of the most striking peculiarities of this sort of vehicle was the width at which the wheels were set apart. The body seemed comparatively narrow, it was very long and covered with white canvas. It had neither windows nor doors, but just the one guarded opening in front. There were no steps leading to this, and indeed a variety of obstacles before it. And the way Grandma effected an entrance was to put a chair on a mound of earth and a cricket on top of the chair, and thus, having climbed up to Fanny's reposeful back, she slipped passively down, feet foremost, to the whiffle tree, from thence she easily gained the plane of the carriage floor. Grandpa and I took a less circuitous, though perhaps not less difficult, route. I sat with Grandpa on the front seat. It may be remarked that the front seat was very much front, and the back seat was very much back. There was a kind of wooden shelf built outside as a resting place for the feet, so that while our heads were under cover, our feet were out, utterly exposed to the weather, and we must either lay them on the shelf or let them hang off into space. Madeline and the children stood at the door to see us off. "'All aboard! Ship ballasted! Wind far! Go ahead, thar, Fanny!' shouted Grandpa, who seemed quite restored in spirits, and held the reins and wielded the whip with a masterful air. He spun sea-yarns, too, all the way, marvellous ones, and Grandma's reproving voice was mellowed by the distance, and so confusedly mingled with the rumbling of the wheels that it seemed hardly to reach him at all. Not that Grandma looked discomforted on this account, or in bad humour. On the contrary, as she sat back there in the ghostly shadows with her hands folded and her hair combed out in resplendent waves on either side of her head, she appeared conscious that every word she uttered was taking root in some obdurate heart. She was in every respect the picture of good will and contentment. But the face under Grandpa's antiquated beaver began to give me a fresh shock every time I looked up at him, for the light and the air were rapidly turning his rejuvenated locks and his poor thin fringe of whiskers to an unnatural greenish tint, while his bushy eyebrows, untouched by the hand of art, shone as white as ever. In spite of the old sea captain's entertaining stories, it seemed indeed a long jaunt to West Wallen. To say that Fanny was a slow horse would be but a feeble expression of the truth. A persevering click, click, click began to arise from Grandma's quarter. This annoyed Grandpa exceedingly. Shut up, Ma! he was moved to exclaim at last. 
I'm steering this craft. Click, 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 came perseveringly from behind. Dumb it, ma, thar, ma, cried Grandpa, exasperated beyond measure. How's this hoss going to hear anything I say if you keep up such a tarnal cacklin'? Just as we were coming out of the thickest part of the woods, about a mile beyond Wallencamp, we discovered a man walking in the distance. It was the only human being we had seen since we started. "'Hello, there's Lovell!' exclaimed Grandpa. "'I was wondering why we hadn't overtook him before. We generally take him in on the road. Yes, yes, that's Lovell, ain't it, teacher?' I put up my glasses helplessly. "'I'm sure,' I said, "'I can't tell positively. "'I have seen Mr. Barlow but once, "'and at that distance I shouldn't know my own father.' "'Must be Lovell,' said Grandpa. "'Yes, I know him. "'Hello thar! Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy!' Grandpa's voice suggested something of the fire and vigor it must have had when it rang out across the foam of waves and pierced the tempest's roar. The man turned and looked at us, and then went on again. "'He don't seem to recognize us,' said Grandma. "'Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy!' shouted Grandpa. The man turned and looked at us again, and this time he stopped and kept on looking. When we got up to him we saw that it wasn't Lovell Barlow at all, but a stranger of trampish appearance, drunk and fiery, and fixed in an aggressive attitude. I was naturally terrified. What if he should attack us in that lonely spot? Grandpa was so old, and moreover, Grandpa was so taken aback to find that it wasn't Lovell that he began some blunt and stammering expression of surprise which only served to increase the stranger's ire. Grandma, imperturbable soul, who never failed to come to the rescue, even in the most desperate emergencies, Grandma climbed over to the front, thrust out her benign head, and said in that deep, calm voice of hers, "'We're going to the house of God, brother. Won't you get in and go, too?' "'No,' our brother replied, doubling up his fists and shaking them menacingly in our faces. "'I won't go to no house of God. What do you mean by overhauling me on the road and asking me to get into your damned old traveling lunatic asylum?' "'Drive on, Pa,' said Grandma coldly. "'He ain't no condition to be labored with now. "'Drive on kind of quick.' "'Kind of quick we could not go, "'but Fanny was made to do her best, "'and we did not pause to look behind. "'When we got to the church, Sunday school had already begun. "'There was Lovell Barlow looking preternaturally stiff in his best clothes, "'sitting with a class of young men. "'He saw us when we came in, and gave me a look of deep meaning.' It was the same expression, as though there was some solemn mutual understanding between us, which he had worn on that night when he gave me his picture. "'There's plenty of young folks' classes,' said Grandma. "'But seeing as we're late, maybe you'd just as soon go right along in with us.' I said that I should like that best, so I went into the old folks' class with Grandma and Grandpa Keeler. There were three pews of old people in front of us, and the teacher— who certainly seemed to me the oldest person I had ever seen, sat in an otherwise vacant pew in front of all, so that his voice being very thin and querulous, we could hear very little that he said, although we were edified in some faint sense by his pious manner of shaking his head and rolling his eyes toward the ceiling. The church was a square wooden edifice of medium size, and contained three stoves, all burning brightly. Against this, and the drowsy effect of their long drive in the sun and wind, my two companions proved powerless to struggle. Grandpa looked furtively up at Grandma, then endeavored to put on, as a sort of apology for what he felt was inevitably coming, a sanctimonious expression which was most unnatural to him, and which soon faded away as the sweet unconsciousness of slumber overspread his features. His head fell back helplessly, his mouth opened wide. He snored, but not very loudly. I looked at Grandma, wondering why her vigilance had failed on this occasion, and, lo, her head was falling peacefully from side to side. She was fast asleep, too. She woke up first, however, and then Grandpa was speedily and adroitly aroused by some means, I think it was a pin, and Grandma fed him with bits of unsweetened flag root, which he munched penitently, though evidently without relish, until he dropped off to sleep again, and she dropped off to sleep again, and so they continued. 
but it always happened that Grandma woke up first, and whereas Grandpa, when the avenging pin pierced his shins, recovered himself with a start and an air of guilty confusion, Grandma opened her eyes at regular intervals, with the utmost calm and placidity, as though she had merely been closing them to engage in a few moments of silent prayer. End of Grandma Keeler Gets Grandpa Ready for Sunday School by Sarah P. McLean Green This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, February 2006. An Heiress from Red Horse by Ambrose Bierce Coronado, June 20th I find myself more and more interested in him. It is not, I am sure, his... Do you know any noun corresponding to the adjective handsome? One does not like to say beauty when speaking of a man. He is handsome enough, heaven knows. I should not even care to trust you with him, faithful of all possible wives that you are, when he looks his best, as he always does. Nor do I think the fascination of his manner has much to do with it. You recollect that the charm of art inheres in that which is undefinable, and to you and me, my dear Irene, I fancy that there is rather less of that in the branch of art under consideration than to girls in their first season. I fancy I know how my fine gentleman produces many of his effects, and could, perhaps, give him a pointer on heightening them. Nevertheless, his manner is something truly delightful. I suppose what interests me chiefly is the man's brains. His conversation is the best I have ever heard, and altogether unlike any one's else. He seems to know everything, as indeed he ought, for he has been everywhere, read everything, seen all there is to see, sometimes I think rather more than is good for him, and had acquaintance with the queerest people. And then his voice, Irene, when I hear it, I actually feel as if I ought to have paid at the door, though, of course, it is my own door. July 3rd. I fear my remarks about Dr. Barrett's must have been, being thoughtless, very silly, or you would not have written of him with such levity, not to say disrespect. Believe me, dearest, he has more dignity and seriousness, of the kind I mean, which is not inconsistent with a manner sometimes playful and always charming, than any of the men that you and I ever met. And young Rayner, you knew Rayner at Monterey, tells me that the men all like him, and that he is treated with something like deference everywhere. There is a mystery, too, something about his connection with the Blavatsky people in northern India. Rayner either would not or could not tell me the particulars. I infer that Dr. Barrett's is thought, don't you dare laugh at me, a magician. Could anything be finer than that? An ordinary mystery is not, of course, as good as a scandal, but when it relates to dark and dreadful practices, to the exercise of unearthly powers, could anything be more piquant? It explains, too, the singular influence the man has upon me. It is the undefinable in his art, black art. Seriously, dear, I quite tremble when he looks me full in the eyes with those unfathomable orbs of his which I have already vainly attempted to describe to you. How dreadful if we have the power to make one fall in love! Do you know if the Blavatsky crowd have that power, outside of Sepoy? July 1. The strangest thing! Last evening, while Auntie was attending one of the hotel hops, I hate them, Dr. Barrett's called. It was scandalously late. I actually believe he had talked with Auntie in the ballroom, and learned from her that I was alone. I had been all the evening contriving how to worm out of him the truth about his connection with the thugs in Sepoy, and all of that black business. But the moment he fixed his eyes on me, for I admitted him, I'm ashamed to say, I was helpless. I trembled. I blushed. I—oh, Irene, Irene! I love the man beyond expression, and you know how it is yourself. Fancy! I, an ugly duckling from Red Horse, daughter, they say, of old Calamity Jim, certainly his heiress, with no living relation but an absurd old aunt, who spoils me a thousand and fifty ways. 
absolutely destitute of everything but a million dollars and a hope in Paris. I, daring to love a god like him? My dear, if I had you here, I could tear your hair out with mortification. I am convinced that he is aware of my feeling, for he stayed but a few moments, said nothing but what another man might have said half as well, and pretending that he had an engagement went away. I learned to-day, a little bird told me, the bell-bird, that he went straight to bed. How does that strike you as evidence of exemplary habits? July 17th. That little wretch Rainer called yesterday, and his babble set me almost wild. He never runs down, that is to say, when he exterminates a score of reputations. More or less, he does not pause between one reputation and the next. By the way, he inquired about you, and his manifestations of interest in you had, I confess, a good deal of resemblance. Mr. Rayner observes no game laws. Like death, which he would inflict if slander were fatal, he has all seasons for his own. But I like him, for we knew one another at Red Horse, when we were young and true-hearted and barefooted. He was known in those far fair days as Giggles, and I—oh, Irene, can you ever forgive me? I was called Gunny. God knows why. Perhaps in allusion to the material of my pinafores. Perhaps because the name is an alliteration with Giggles. For Gig and I were inseparable playmates. And the miners may have thought it a delicate compliment to recognize some kind of relationship between us. Later we took in a third, another of adversity's brood, who, like Garrick, between tragedy and comedy, had a chronic inability to adjudicate the rival charms to herself of frost and famine. Between him and the grave there was seldom anything more than a single suspender, and the hope of a meal which would at the same time support life and make it insupportable. He literally picked up a precarious living for himself and an aged mother by chloriding the dumps. That is to say, the miners permitted him to search the heaps of waste rock for such pieces of pay ore as had been overlooked, and these he sacked up and sold at the syndicate mill. He became a member of our firm, Gunny, Giggles, and Dumps, thenceforth, through my favor, for I could not then, nor could I now, be indifferent to his courage and prowess in defending against Giggles the immemorial right of his sex to insult a strange and unprotected female, myself. After old Jim struck it in the calamity, and I began to wear shoes and go to school, and in emulation Giggles took to washing his face, and became Jack Rayner, of Wells Fargo and Company, and old Mrs. Bartz was herself chlorided to her father's, Dumps drifted over to San Juan Smith, and turned stage driver, and was killed by road agents and so forth. Why do I tell you all this, dear? Because it is heavy on my heart, because I walk the valley of humility, because I am subduing myself to permanent consciousness of my unworthiness to unloose the latchet of Dr. Barrett's shoes. Because, oh dear, oh dear, there's a cousin of Dumps at this hotel. I haven't spoken to him. I never had any acquaintance with him. But do you suppose he has recognized me? Do, please, give me in your next, your candid, sure enough opinion about it, and say you don't think so. Do you think he knows about me already, and that is why he left me last evening, when he saw that I blushed and trembled like a fool under his eyes? You know I can't bribe all the newspapers, and I can't go back on anybody who was good to Gunny at Red Horse, not if I am pitched out of society into the sea. So the skeleton sometimes rattles behind the door. I never cared much before, as you know, but now, now it is not the same. Jack Raynor, I am sure of, he will not tell him. He seems, indeed, to hold him in such respect as hardly to dare speak to him at all. And I'm a good deal that way myself. Dear, dear, I wish I had something besides a million dollars. If Jack were three inches taller, I'd marry him alive and go back to Red Horse, and wear sackcloth again to the end of my miserable days. July 25th We had a perfectly splendid sunset last evening and I must tell you all about it. I ran away from Auntie and everybody, and was walking alone on the beach. I expect you to believe, you infidel, that I had not looked out of my window on the seaward side of the hotel, and seen him walking alone on the beach. If you are not lost to every feeling of womanly delicacy, you will accept my statement without question. I soon established myself under my sunshade, 
and had for some time been gazing out dreamily over the sea, when he approached, walking close to the edge of the water, it was ebb tide. I assure you the wet sand actually brightened about his feet. As he approached me, he lifted his hat, saying, "'Miss Dement, may I sit with you, or will you walk with me?' The possibility that neither might be agreeable seems not to have occurred to him. Did you ever know such assurance? Assurance? My dear, it was gall, downright gall. Well, I didn't find it wormwood, and replied with my untutored red horse heart in my throat, I, I shall be pleased to do anything. Could words have been more stupid? There are depths of fatuity in me, friend, oh, my soul, which are simply bottomless. He extended his hand, smiling, and I delivered mine into it without a moment's hesitation, and when his fingers closed about it to assist me to my feet, the consciousness that it trembled made me blush worse than the red west. I got up, however, and after a while— Observing that he had not let go my hand, I pulled on it a little, but unsuccessfully. He simply held on, saying nothing, but looking down into my face with some kind of a smile. I didn't know, how could I, whether it was affectionate, derisive, or what, for I did not look at him. How beautiful he was, with the red fires of the sunset burning in the depths of his eyes. Do you know, dear— if the thugs and experts of the Blavatsky region have any special kind of eyes? Ah, you should have seen his superb attitude, the godlike inclination of his head, as he stood over me, after I had got upon my feet. It was a noble picture, but I soon destroyed it, for I began at once to sink again to the earth. There was only one thing for him to do, and he did it. He supported me with an arm about my waist. "'Miss Dement, are you ill?' he said." It was not an exclamation. There was neither alarm nor solicitude in it. If he had added, I suppose that is about what I am expected to say, he would hardly have expressed his sense of the situation more clearly. His manner filled me with shame and indignation, for I was suffering acutely. I wrenched my hand out of his, grasped the arm supporting me, and, pushing myself free, fell plump into the sand and sat helpless. My hat had fallen off in the struggle, and my hair tumbled about my face and shoulders in the most mortifying way. "'Go away from me!' I cried, half choking. "'Oh, please go away, you—you you thug! How dare you think that when my leg is asleep!' I actually said those identical words, and then I broke down and sobbed. Irene, I blubbered! His manner altered in an instant. I could see that much through my fingers and hair. He dropped on one knee beside me— parted the tangle of hair, and said in the tenderest way, "'My poor girl, God knows I have not intended to pain you. How should I? I who love you, I who have loved you for—for for years and years.' He had pulled my wet hands away from my face, and was covering them with kisses. My cheeks were like two coals. My whole face was flaming, and I think steaming. What could I do? I hid it on his shoulder. There was no other place— and, oh, my dear friend, how my leg tingled and thrilled, and how I wanted to kick! We sat so for a long time. He had released one of my hands to pass his arm about me again, and I possessed myself of my handkerchief, and was drying my eyes and my nose. I would not look up until that was done. He tried in vain to push me a little away and gaze into my eyes. Presently, when it was all right, and it had grown a bit dark, I lifted my head, looked him straight in the eyes, and smiled my best, my level best, dear. "'What do you mean?' I said, by years and years. "'Dearest,' he replied, very gravely, very earnestly, "'in the absence of the sunken cheeks, the hollow eyes, the lank hair, the slouching gait, the rags, dirt, and youth, can you not, will you not understand? Gunny, I'm dumps. In a moment I was upon my feet, and he upon his— I seized him by the lapels of his coat, and peered into his handsome face in the deepening darkness. I was breathless with excitement. "'And you are not dead?' I asked, hardly knowing what I said. "'Only dead in love, dear. I recovered from the road agent's bullet, but this, I fear, is fatal. "'But about Jack, Mr. Rayner, don't you know—' "'I am ashamed to say, darling, that it was through that unworthy person's invitation that I came here from Vienna.' 
Irene, they have played it upon your affectionate friend. Mary Jane Dement. P.S. The worst of it is that there is no mystery. That was an invention of Jack to arouse my curiosity and interest. James is not a thug. He solemnly assures me that in all his wanderings he has never set foot in Sepoy. End of An Heiress from Red Horse by Ambrose Bierce Her Turn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Her Turn by D. H. Lawrence She was his second wife, and so there was between them that truce which is never held between a man and his first woman. He was one for the women, and as such, an exception among the colliers. In spite of their prudery, the neighbour women liked him. He was big, naive, and very courteous with them. He was so, even to his second wife. Being a large man of considerable strength and perfect health, he earned good money in the pit. His natural courtesy saved him from enemies, while his fresh interest in life made his presence always agreeable. So he went his own way, had always plenty of friends, also a good job down pit. He gave his wife thirty-five shillings a week. He had two grown-up sons at home, and they paid twelve shillings each. There was only one child by the second marriage, so Radford considered his wife did well. Eighteen months ago, Brian and Wentworth's men were out on strike for eleven weeks. During that time, Mrs. Radford could neither conjole nor entreat nor nag the ten-shilling strike paid from her husband, so that when the second strike came on, she was prepared for action. Radford was going, quite inconspicuously, to the publican's wife at the Golden Horn. She is a large, easy-going lady of forty, and her husband is sixty-three, moreover crippled with rheumatism. She sits in the little bar parlour of the wayside public house, knitting for dear life, and sipping a very moderate glass of scotch. When a decent man arrives at the three-foot width of bar, she rises, serves him, surveys him over, and, if she likes his looks, says, Won't you step inside, sir? If he steps inside, he will find not more than one or two men present. The room is warm, quite small. The landlady knits. She gives a few polite words to the stranger, then resumes her conversation with the man who interests her most. She is straight, highly coloured, with indifferent brown eyes. What was that, you asked me, Mr. Radford? What is the difference between a donkey's tail and a rainbow? asked Radford, who had a consuming passion for conundrums. All the difference in the world, replied the landlady. Yes, but what's so special difference? I shall have to give it up again. You think me a donkey's head, I'm afraid. Not likely, but just you consider now where? The conundrum was still under way when a girl entered. She was swarthy, a fine animal, after she had gone out. Do you know who that is? asked the landlady. I can't say as I do, replied Radford. She's Frederick Pinnock's daughter, from Stony Ford. She's courting our Willie. And a fine lass, too. Yes, fine enough, as far as that goes. What sort of wife will she make him, think you? You just let me consider a bit, said the man. He took out a pocket book and a pencil. The landlady continued to talk to the other guests. Radford was a big fellow black head, with a brown moustache, and darkish blue eyes. His voice, naturally deep, was pitched in his throat, and had a peculiar tenor quality, rather husky and disturbing. He modulated it a good deal as he spoke, as men do who talk much with women. Always there was a certain indolence in his carriage. Our Mester's lazy, his wife said. 
There's many a bit of a jab wants doing, but get him to do it if you can. But she knew he was merely indifferent to the little jobs and not lazy. He sat writing for about ten minutes, at the end of which time he read, I see a fine girl full of life. I see her just ready for wedlock. But there's jealousy between her eyebrows, and jealousy on her mouth. I see trouble ahead. Willie is delicate. She would do him no good. She would never see when he wasn't well. She would only see what she wanted. So in phrases he got down his thoughts. He had to fumble for expression, and therefore anything serious he wanted to say he wrote in poetry, as he called it. Presently the landlady rose, saying, Well, well, I shall have to be looking after our mister. I shall be in again before we close. Radford sat quite comfortably on. In a while he too bade the company good night. When he got home at a quarter past eleven, his sons were in bed and his wife sat awaiting him. She was a woman of medium height, fat and sleek, a dumpling. Her black hair was parted smooth. Her narrow open eyes were sly and satirical. She had a peculiar twang in her rather sleering voice. Our missus is a puss-puss, he said easily of her. Her extraordinarily smooth, slick face was remarkable. She was very healthy. He never came in drunk. Having taken off his coat and his cap, he sat down to supper in his shirt sleeves. Do as he might, she was fascinated by him. He had a strong neck, with the crisp hair growing low. Let her be angry as she would, yet she had a passion for that neck of his, particularly when she saw the great vein rib under the skin. I think, Mrs., he said, I'd rather have a smite of cheese than this meat. Well, can't you get it yourself? Yeah, surely I can, he said, and went out to the pantry. I think if you're coming in at this time of the night, you can wait on yourself, she justified herself. She moved uneasily in her chair. There were several jam tarts alongside the cheese on the dish he brought. Your missus, them tam tafflings go down very nicely, he said. Oh, will they? Then you'd better help to pay for them, she said, amiable, but determined. Now, what art after? What am I after? Why, can't you think? she said sarcastically. I'm not for thinking, missus. No, I know you're not, but where's my money? You've been paid the union today. Where do I come in? They've got money, and the mun use it. Thank you, and haven't you done as well? I hadna, not till we was paid, not a halfpenny. Then you ought to be ashamed of yourself to say so. Happen so? We'll go shares with the union money, she said. That's nothing but what's right. We sure enough. They's got plenty of money as they can use. Oh, all right, she said. I will do. She went to bed. It made her feel sharp that she could not get at him. The next day she was just as usual, but at eleven o'clock she took her purse and went up town. Trade was very slack. Men stood about in gangs. Men were playing marbles everywhere in the streets. It was a sunny morning. Mrs. Radford went into the furniture and upholsterer's shop. There's a few things, she said to Mr. Elcock, as I'm wanting for the house, and I might as well get them now, while the men's at home, and can shift me the furniture. She put her fat purse onto the counter with a click. The man should know she was not wanting strap. She bought linoleum for the kitchen, a new ringer, a breakfast service, a spring mattress, and various other things, keeping a mere thirty shillings, which she tied in a corner of her handkerchief, in her purse with some loose silver. Her husband was gardening in a desultory fashion when she got back home. The daffodils were out. The colts in the field at the end of the garden were tossing their velvety brown necks. See thee, missus, called Radford from the shed, which stood halfway down the path. Two doves in a cage were cooing. What have you got? asked the woman, as she approached. 
he held out to her in his big earthy hand a tortoise. The reptile was very, very slowly issuing its head again to the warmth. He's wakened up betimes, said Radford. He's like the men wakened up for a holiday, said the wife. Radford scratched the little beast's scaly head. We pleased to see him out, he said. They had just finished dinner when a man knocked at the door. From Alcox, he said. The plump woman took up the clothes basket containing the crockery she had bought. Whatever has got there? asked her husband. We've been wanting some breakfast cups for ages, so I went up town and got em this morning, she replied. He watched her taking out the crockery. Hmm, he said. Just been on the spend, seemly. Again there was a thud at the door. The man had put down a roll of linoleum. Mr. Radford went to look at it. They come rolling in, he exclaimed. Who's grumbled more than you about the raggy oilcloth of this kitchen? Said the insidious, cat-like voice of the wife. It's all right, it's all right, said Radford. The carter came up the entry with another roll, which he deposited with a grunt at the door. And how much do you reckon this lot is? he asked. Oh, they're all paid for, don't worry, replied the wife. Shall you give me a hand, mister? asked the carter. Radford followed him down the entry in his easy, slouching way. His wife went after. His waistcoat was hanging loose over his shirt. She watched his easy movement of well-being as she followed him, and she laughed to herself. The carter took hold of one end of the wire mattress, dragged it forth. Well, this is a corker, said Radford, as he received the burden. Now the mangle, said the carter. What does reckon there's been up to, missus? asked the husband. I said to myself last wash day, if I had to turn that mangle again, they'd have to wash the clothes thyself. Radford followed the carter down the entry again. In the street, women were standing watching, and dozens of men were lounging round the cart. One officiously helped with the ringer. Give him threepence, said Mrs. Radford. Give him thousand, replied her husband. I've no change under half a crown. Radford tipped the carter and returned indoors. He surveyed the array of crockery, linoleum, mattress, mangle, and other goods crowding the house and the yard. Well, this is a winder, he repeated. We stood in need of them enough, she replied. I hope that's got plenty more from where they came from, he replied dangerously. That's just what I haven't, she opened her purse. Two half crowns, that's every copper I've got in the world. He stood very still as he looked. It's right, she said. There was a certain smug sense of satisfaction about her. A wave of anger came over him, blinding him, but he waited and waited. Suddenly his arm leapt up, the fist clenched, and his eyes blazed at her. She shrunk away, pale and frightened, but he dropped his fist to his side, turned and went out muttering. He went down to the shed that stood in the middle of the garden. There he picked up the tortoise and stood with bent head, rubbing its horny head. She stood hesitating, watching him. Her heart was heavy and yet there was a curious, cat-like look of satisfaction round her eyes. Then she went indoors and gazed at her new cups admiringly. The next week he handed her his half-sovereign without a word. "'You'll want some for yourself,' she said, and she gave him a shilling. He accepted it. End of story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrated by Sean McKinley. Hunter Quartermain's Story by H. Ryder Haggard. Sir Henry Curtis, as everybody acquainted with him knows, is one of the most hospitable men on earth. It was in the course of the enjoyment of his hospitality at his place in Yorkshire the other day, 
that I heard the hunting story which I am now about to transcribe. Many of those who read it will no doubt have heard some of the strange rumors that are flying about to the effect that Sir Henry Curtis and his friend, Captain Good, R.N., recently found a vast treasure of diamonds out in the heart of Africa, supposed to have been hidden by the Egyptians, or King Solomon, or some other antique people. I first saw the matter alluded to in a paragraph in one of the society papers the day before I started for Yorkshire to pay my visit to Curtis, and arrived, needless to say, burning with curiosity, for there is something very fascinating to the mind in the idea of hidden treasure. When I reached the hall, I at once asked Curtis about it, and he did not deny the truth of the story, but on my pressing him, to tell it he would not, nor would Captain Good, who was also staying in the house. "'You would not believe me if I did,' Sir Henry said, with one of the hearty laughs which seemed to come right out of his great lungs. "'You must wait till Hunter Quatermain comes. He will arrive here from Africa to-night, and I am not going to say a word about the matter, or good, either, until he turns up. Quatermain was with us all through. He has known about the business for years and years, and if it had not been for him, we should not have been here to-day. I am going to meet him presently. I could not get a word more out of him, nor could anybody else, though we were all dying of curiosity, especially some of the ladies. I shall never forget how they looked in the drawing-room before dinner, when Captain Good produced a great rough diamond, weighing fifty carats or more, and told them that he had many larger than that. If ever I saw curiosity and envy printed on their faces, I saw them then. It was just at this moment that the door was opened, and Mr. Allan Quatermain announced, whereupon Good put the diamond in his pocket, and sprang at a little man who limped shyly into the room, convoyed by Sir Henry Curtis himself. "'Here he is, Good, safe and sound,' said Sir Henry gleefully. "'Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to one of the oldest hunters and the very best shot in Africa, who has killed more elephants and lions than any other man alive." Everybody turned and stared politely at the curious-looking little lame man, and though his size was insignificant, he was quite worth staring at. He had short, grizzled hair, which stood about an inch above his head, like the bristles of a brush, gentle brown eyes that seemed to notice everything and a withered face, tanned to the color of mahogany from exposure to the weather. He spoke, too, when he returned Good's enthusiastic greeting, with a curious little accent which made his speech noticeable. It so happened that I sat next to Mr. Allan Quatermain at dinner, and, of course, did my best to draw him. But he was not to be drawn. He admitted that he had recently been a long journey into the interior of Africa with Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good, and that they had found treasure, and then politely turned the subject and began to ask me questions about England, where he had never been before. That is, since he came to years of discretion. Of course, I did not find this very interesting and so cast about for some means to bring the conversation round again. Now we were dining in an oak-panelled vestibule, and on the wall opposite to me were fixed two gigantic elephant tusks, and under them a pair of buffalo horns, very rough and knotted, showing that they came off an old bull, and having the tip of one horn split and chipped, I noticed that Hunter Quatermain's eyes kept glancing at these trophies, and took an occasion to ask him if he knew anything about them. "'I ought to,' he answered, with a little laugh. "'The elephant to which those trunks belonged tore one of our party right in two about eighteen months ago, and as for the buffalo horns, they were nearly my death, and were the end of a servant of mine to whom I was much attached. I gave him to Sir Henry when he left Natal some months ago, and Quatermain sighed and turned to answer a question from the lady whom he had taken down to dinner, and who, needless to say, 
was also employed in trying to pump him about the diamonds. Indeed, all around the table there was a simmer of scarcely suppressed excitement, which when the servants had left the room could no longer be restrained. "'Now, Mr. Quatermain, said the lady next to him, "'we have been kept in an agony of suspense by Sir Henry and Captain Good, "'who have persistently refused to tell us a word of this story "'about the hidden treasure till you came, "'and we simply can bear it no longer, so please begin at once.' "'Yes,' everybody said. "'Go on, please.' "'Hunter Quatermain glanced around the table apprehensively, he did not seem to appreciate finding himself the object of so much curiosity. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said at last, with a shake of his grizzled head, "'I am very sorry to disappoint you, but I cannot do it. It is this way. At the request of Sir Henry and Captain Good, I have written down a true and plain account of King Solomon's mines, and how we found them so you will soon be able to learn all about that wonderful adventure for yourselves. But until then I will say nothing about it, not from any wish to disappoint your curiosity, or to make myself important, but simply because the whole story partakes so much of the marvellous, that I am afraid to tell it in a piecemeal, hasty fashion, for fear I should be set down as one of those common fellows of whom there are so many in my profession, who are not ashamed to narrate things they have not seen, and even to tell wonderful stories about wild animals they have never killed. And I think that my companions in adventure, Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good, will bear me out in what I say. Yes, Quatermain, I think you are quite right, said Henry. Precisely the same considerations have forced Good and myself to hold our tongues, and we did not wish to be bracketed with, well, with other famous travellers. There was a murmur of disappointment at these announcements. "'I believe you are all hoaxing us,' said the young lady next to Mr. Quartermain rather sharply. "'Believe me,' answered the old hunter, with a quaint courtesy and a little bow of his grizzled head. Though I have lived all my life in the wilderness, and amongst savages, I have neither the heart nor the want of manners to wish to deceive one so lovely. Whereat the young lady, who was pretty, looked appeased. This is very dreadful, I broke in. We ask for bread, and you give us a stone, Mr. Quartermain. The least that you can do is to tell us the story of the tusks opposite the buffalo horns underneath. We won't let you off with less. I am but a poor story-teller, put in the old hunter, but if you will forgive my want of skill, I shall be happy to tell you, not the story of the tusks, for that is part of the history of our journey to King Solomon's mines, but that of the buffalo horns beneath them, which is now ten years old. Bravo, Quatermain, said Sir Henry. We shall all be delighted. Fire away! Fill up your glass first. The little man did as he was bid, took a sip of claret, and began. About ten years ago I was hunting up in the far interior of Africa, at a place called Gatgara. Not a great way from the Chobe River, I had with me four native servants, namely, a driver and voorlooper, or leader, who were natives of Matabela land a Hottentot named Hans, who had once been the slave of a Transvaal boer, and a Zulu hunter, who, for five years, had accompanied me upon my trips, and whose name was Mashune. Now near Gatgara I found a fine piece of healthy, park-like country, where the grass was very good, considering the time of year, and here I made a little camp, or headquarter settlement, from whence I went expeditions on all sides in search of game, especially elephant. My luck, however, was bad. I got but little ivory. I was therefore very glad when some natives brought me news that a large herd of elephants were feeding in a valley about thirty miles away. At first I thought of trekking down to the valley, wagon and all, but gave up the idea 
on hearing that it was infested with the deadly tsetse fly, which is certain death to all animals except men, donkeys, and wild game. So I reluctantly determined to leave the wagon in the charge of the Matabele leader and driver, and to start on a trip into the thorn country, accompanied only by the Hottentot Hans and Mashune. Accordingly, on the following morning we started, and on the evening of the next day reached the spot where the elephants were reported to be. But here again we were met by ill luck. That the elephants had been there was evident enough, for their spoor was plentiful, and so were other traces of their presence in the shape of mimosa trees torn out of the ground, and placed topsy-turvy on their flat crowns, in order to enable the great beasts to feed on their sweet roots. But the elephants themselves were conspicuous by their absence. They had elected to move on. This being so, there was only one thing to do and that was to move after them, which we did, and a pretty hunt they led us. For a fortnight or more we dodged about after those elephants, coming up with them on two occasions, and a splendid herd they were, only, however, to lose them again. At length we came up with them a third time. I managed to shoot one bull, and then they started off again, where it was useless to try and follow them. After this, I gave it up in disgust, and we made the best of our way back to the camp, not in the sweetest of tempers, carrying the tusks of the elephant I had shot. It was on the afternoon of the fifth day of our tramp that we reached the little copy overlooking the spot where the wagon stood, and I confess that I climbed it with a pleasurable sense of homecoming, for his wagon is the hunter's home as much as his house is that of the civilized person. I reached the top of the copy, and looked in the direction where the friendly white tent of the wagon should be. But there was no wagon, only a black, burnt plain, stretching away as far as the eye could reach. I rubbed my eyes, looked again, and made out on the spot of the camp, not my wagon, but some charred beams of wood. Half wild with grief and anxiety, followed by Hans and Mashune, I ran at full speed down the slope of the copy and across the space of plain below to the spring of water where my camp had been. I was soon there, only to find that my worst suspicions were confirmed. The wagon and all of its contents, including my spare guns and ammunition, had been destroyed by a grass fire. Now before I started, I had left orders with the driver to burn off the grass around the camp in order to guard against accidents of this nature. And here was the reward for my folly. A very proper illustration of the necessity, especially where natives are concerned, of doing a thing oneself if one wants it done at all. Evidently the lazy rascals had not burnt around the wagon. Most probably, indeed, they had themselves carelessly fired the tall and resinous tambuki grass near by. The wind had driven the flames on to the wagon tent, and there was quickly an end of the matter. As for the driver and leader, I know not what became of them. Probably, fearing my anger, they bolted, taking the oxen with them. I have never seen them, from that hour to this. I sat down on the black veldt by the spring, and gazed at the charred axles and diesel boom of my wagon. And I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I felt inclined to weep. As for Meshune and Hans, they cursed away vigorously, one in Zulu and the other in Dutch. Ours was a pretty position. We were nearly three hundred miles away from Bamangwato the capital of Kama's country, which was the nearest spot where we could get any help, and our ammunition, spare guns, clothing, food, and everything else were all totally destroyed. I had just what I stood in, which was a flannel shirt, a pair of velt shoes, or shoes of rawhide, 
my eight-bore rifle, and a few cartridges. Hans and Mashune had also each a martini rifle, and some cartridges, not many. And it was with this equipment that we had to undertake a journey of three hundred miles through a desolate and almost uninhabited region. I can assure you that I have rarely been in a worse position, and I have been in some queer ones. However, these things are the natural incidents of a hunter's life, and the only thing to do was to make the best of them. Accordingly, after passing a comfortless night by the remains of my wagon, we started next morning on our long journey toward civilization. Now, if I were to set to work to tell you all the troubles and incidents of that dreadful journey, I should keep you listening here till midnight, so I will, with your permission, pass on to the particular adventure of which the pair of buffalo horns opposite are the melancholy memento. We had been travelling for about a month, living and getting along as best we could, when one evening we camped some forty miles from Bamangwato. By this time we were indeed in a melancholy plight, footsore, half-starved, and utterly worn out. And, in addition, I was suffering from a sharp attack of fever, which half-blinded me and made me weak as a babe. Our ammunition, too, was exhausted. I had only one cartridge left for my eight-bore rifle, and Hans and Mashune, who were armed with Martini Henrys, had three between them. It was about an hour from sundown when we halted and lit a fire, for luckily we had still a few matches. It was a charming spot to camp, I remember. Just off the game track we were following was a little hollow, fringed about with flat-crowned mimosa trees, and at the bottom of the hollow a spring of clear water welled up out of the earth, and formed a pool, round the edges of which grew an abundance of watercresses of an exact similar kind to those which were handed round the table just now. Now, we had no food of any kind left, having that morning devoured the last remains of a little oribe antelope, which I had shot two days previously. Accordingly, Hans, who was a better shot than Mashune, took two of the three remaining martini cartridges, and started out to see if he could not kill a buck for supper. I was too weak to go myself. Meanwhile, Mashune employed himself in dragging together some dead boughs of the mimosa trees to make him a sort of skirm, or shelter for us to sleep in about forty yards from the edge of the pool of water. We had been greatly troubled with lions in the course of our long tramp, and only on the previous night have very nearly been attacked by them, which made me nervous, especially in my weak state. Just as we had finished the skirm, or rather something which did duty for one, Mashune and I heard a shot, apparently fired about a mile away. Hark to it, sung out Mashune in Zulu, more, I fancy, by way of keeping his spirits up than for any other reason. For he was a sort of black mark Tapley, and very cheerful under difficulties. Hark to the wonderful sound with which the Mabuna, the Boers, shook our fathers to the ground at the Battle of the Blood River. We are hungry now, my father. Our stomachs are small and withered up like a dried ox's paunch but they will soon be full of good meat. Hans is a Hottentot and an Amphagazan, that is, a low fellow, but he shoots straight. Ah, he certainly shoots straight. Be of a good heart, my father. There will soon be meat upon the fire, and we shall rise up men. And so he went on talking nonsense, till I told him to stop, because he made my head ache with his empty words. Shortly after we heard the shot, the sun sank in his red splendor, and there fell upon earth and sky the great hush of the African wilderness. The lions were not up as yet, 
they would probably wait for the moon, and the birds and the beasts were all at rest. I cannot describe the intensity of the quiet of the night. To me, in my weak state, and fretting as I was over the non-return of the Hottentot Hans, it seemed almost ominous, as though nature were brooding over some tragedy which was being enacted in her sight. It was quiet, quiet as death, and lonely as the grave. Mashune, I said at last, where is Hans? My heart is heavy for him. Nay, my father, I know not. Mayhap he is weary, and sleeps, or mayhap he has lost his way. Mashune, art thou a boy to talk folly to me? I answered. Tell me, in all the years thou hast hunted by my side, didst thou ever know a Hottentot to lose his path, or to sleep upon the way to camp? Nay, Mekumazen, that, ladies, is my native name, and means the man who gets up by night, or who is always awake. I know not where he is. But though we talked thus, we neither of us liked to hint at what was in both our minds, namely, that misfortunate had overtaken the poor Hottentot. Mashune, I said at last, go down to the water, and bring me of those green herbs that grow there. I am hungered, and must eat something. Nay, my father, surely the ghosts are there, and they come out of the water at night, and sit upon the banks to dry themselves. An Isanusi told it me. Mashune was, I think, one of the bravest men I ever knew in the daytime, but he had a more than civilized dread of the supernatural. Must I go myself, thou fool? I said sternly. Nay, Mekumazan, if thy heart yearns for strange things like a sick woman, I go, even if the ghosts devour me. And accordingly he went, and soon returned with a large bundle of watercresses, of which I ate greedily. Art thou hungry? I asked the great Zulu presently, as he sat eyeing me eating. Never was I hungrier, my father. Then eat, and I pointed to the watercresses. Nay, Mekumazan, I cannot eat those herbs. If thou dost not eat, thou wilt starve. Eat, Mashune. He stared at the watercresses doubtfully for a while, and at last seized a handful and crammed them into his mouth, crying out as he did so. Oh, why was I born, that I should live to feed on green weeds like an ox? Surely, if my mother could have known it, she would have killed me when I was born. And so he went on, lamenting, between each fistful of watercresses, till all were finished, when he declared that he was full indeed of stuff, but it lay very cold on his stomach, like snow upon a mountain. At any other time, I should have laughed, for it must be admitted that he had a ludicrous way of putting things. Zulus do not like green food. Just after Mashune had finished his watercresses, we heard the loud woof, woof of a lion, who was evidently promenading much nearer to our little skirm than was pleasant. Indeed, looking into the darkness and listening intently, I could hear his snoring breath, and catch the light of his great yellow eyes. We shouted loudly, and Mashune threw some sticks on the fire to frighten him, which apparently had the desired effect, for we saw no more of him for a while. Just after we had had this fright from the lion, the moon rose in her fullest splendor, throwing a robe of silver light over all the earth. I have rarely seen a more beautiful moonrise. I remember that sitting in the skirm, I could with ease read faint pencil notes in my pocket-book. As soon as the moon was up, game began to trek down to the water just below us. I could, from where I sat, see all sorts of them passing along a little ridge that ran to our right, on their way to the drinking-place. Indeed, one buck, 
a large eland, came within twenty yards of the skirm, and stood at a gaze, staring at it suspiciously, his beautiful head and twisted horns standing out clearly against the sky. I had, I recollect, every mind to have a pull at him, on the chance of providing ourselves with a good supply of beef, but remembering that we had but two cartridges left, and the extreme uncertainty of a shot by moonlight, I at length decided to refrain. The eland presently moved on to the water, and a minute or two afterwards there arose a great sound of splashing, followed by the quick fall of galloping hoofs. "'What's that, Mashune?' I asked him. "'That damn lion! Book smell him!' replied the Zulu in English, of which he had a superficial knowledge. Scarcely were the words out of his mouth before we heard a sort of whine over the other side of the pool, which was instantly answered by a loud coughing roar close to us. "'By Jove!' I said. "'There are two of them. They have lost the buck. We must look out. They don't catch us.' And again we made up the fire and shouted, with the result that the lions moved off. Mashune, I said, do you watch till the moon gets over that tree, when it will be the middle of the night. Then wake me. Watch well now, or the lions will be picking those worthless bones of yours before you are three hours older. I must rest a little, or I shall die. Cools, chief, answered the Zulu. Sleep, my father, sleep in peace. My eyes shall be open as the stars, and like the stars watch over you. Although I was so weak, I could not at once follow his advice. To begin with, my head ached with fever, and I was torn with anxiety as to the fate of the Hottentot Hans, and indeed as to our own fate, left with sore feet, empty stomachs, and two cartridges to find our way to Bamangwato, forty miles off. Then the mere sensation of knowing that there are one or more hungry lions prowling round you somewhere in the dark is disquieting. However well one may be used to it, and by keeping the attention on the stretch tends to prevent one from sleeping. In addition to all these troubles, too, I was, I remember, seized with a dreadful longing for a pipe of tobacco, whereas, under the circumstances, I might as well have longed for the moon. At last, however, I fell into an uneasy sleep, as full of bad dreams as a prickly pear is of its points, one of which, I recollect, was that I was setting my naked foot upon a cobra, which rose upon its tail and hissed my name. Macumazan, into my ear. Indeed, the cobra hissed with such persistency that at last I roused myself. Macumazan, Nanzia, Nanzia, there, there, whispered Mashune's voice into my drowsy ears. Raising myself, I opened my eyes, and I saw Mashune kneeling by my side and pointing towards the water. Following the line of his outstretched hand, my eyes fell upon a sight that made me jump. Old hunter as I was, even in those days, about twenty paces from the little skirm was a large ant-heap, and on the summit of the ant-heap her four feet, rather close together so as to find standing space, stood the massive form of a big lioness. Her head was towards the skirm, and in the bright moonlight I saw her lower it and lick her paws. Mashune thrust the martini rifle into my hands, whispering that it was loaded. I lifted it and covered the lioness, but found that even in that light I could not make out the foresight of the martini, as it would be madness to fire without doing so, for the result would probably be that I should wound the lioness if indeed I did not miss her altogether. I lowered the rifle, and hastily, tearing a fragment of paper from one of the leaves of my pocket-book, which I had been consulting just before I went to sleep, I proceeded to fix it on to the front sight. 
but all this took a little time, and before the paper was satisfactorily arranged, Mashune again gripped me by the arm and pointed to a dark heap under the shade of a small mimosa tree which grew not more than ten paces from the skirm. "'Well, what is it?' I whispered. "'I can see nothing.' "'It is another lion,' he answered. "'Nonsense. Thy heart is dread with fear. Thou seest double.' And I bent forward over the edge of the surrounding fence, and stared at the heap. Even as I said the words, the dark mass rose and stalked out of the moonlight. It was a magnificent, black-maned lion, one of the largest I had ever seen. When he had gone two or three steps, he caught sight of me, halted, and stood there, gazing straight towards us. He was so close that I could see the firelight reflected in his wicked, greenish eyes. "'Shoot! Shoot!' said Mashune. "'The devil is coming. He is going to spring.' I raised the rifle, and got the bit of paper on the foresight, straight on to a little path of white hair, just where the throat is set into the chest and shoulders. As I did so, the lion glanced back over his shoulder, as according to my experience, a lion nearly always does before he springs. Then he dropped his body a little, and I saw his big paws spread out upon the ground as he put his weight on them to gather purchase. In haste I pressed the trigger of the martini, and not a moment too soon, for as I did so he was in the act of springing. The report of the rifle rang out sharp and clear on the intense silent of the night, and in another second the great brute had landed on his head within four feet of us, and rolling over and over towards us, was sending the bushes which composed our little fence flying with convulsive strokes of his great paws. We sprang out of the other side of the skirm, and he rolled on to it, and into it, and then right through the fire. Next he raised himself, and sat upon his haunches like a great dog and began to roar. Heavens, how he roared! I never heard anything like it before or since. He kept filling his lungs with air, and then emitting in the most heart-shaking volumes of sound. Suddenly, in the middle of one of the loudest roars, he rolled over on his side and lay still, and I knew that he was dead. A lion generally dies upon his side. With a sigh of relief, I looked up towards his mate upon the ant-heap. She was standing there, apparently petrified with astonishment, looking over her shoulder and lashing her tail, but to our intense joy, when the dying beast ceased roaring, she turned, and with one enormous bound, vanished into the night. Then we advanced cautiously toward the prostrate brute, Mashune, droning an improvised Zulu song as he went about how Makumazan, the hunter of hunters, whose eyes were open by night as well as by day, put his hand down the lion's stomach when it came to devour him, and pulled out his heart by the roots, etc., etc., by way of expressing his satisfaction, in hyperbolic Zulu way, at the turn events had taken. There was no need for caution. The lion was as dead as though he had already been stuffed with straw. The martini bullet had entered within an inch of the white spot I had aimed at, and it travelled right through him, passing out at the right buttock, near the root of the tail. The martini has wonderful driving power, though the shock it gives to the system is, comparatively speaking, slight, owing to the smallest of the hole it makes but fortunately the lion is an easy beast to kill. I passed the rest of that night in a profound slumber, my head reposing upon the deceased lion's flank, a position that had, I thought, a beautiful touch of irony about it, though the smell of his singed hair was disagreeable, when I woke again the faint primrose lights of dawn were flushing in the eastern sky. For a moment 
I could not understand the chill sense of anxiety that lay like a lump of ice at my heart, till the feel and smell of the skin of the dead lion beneath my head recalled the circumstances in which we were placed. I rose, and eagerly looked round to see if I could discover any signs of Hans, who, if he had escaped accident, would surely return to us at dawn. Then hope grew faint, and I felt that it was not well with the poor fellow. Setting Mashune to build the fire, I hastily removed the hide from the flank of the lion, which was indeed a splendid beast, and cutting off some lumps of flesh, we toasted and ate them greedily. Lion's flesh, strange as it may seem, is very good eating, and tastes more like veal than anything else. By the time we had finished our much-needed meal, the sun was setting up, and after a drink of water and a wash at the pool, we started to try to find Hans, leaving the dead lion to the tender mercies of the hyenas. Both Mashune and myself were, by constant practice, pretty good hands at tracking, and we had not much difficulty in following the Hottentot spoor. Faint as it was, we had gone on this way for half an hour or so, and were, perhaps a mile or more, from the site of our camping place, when we discovered the spoor of a solitary bull-buffalo mixed up with the spoor of Hans, and were able from various indications to make out that he had been tracking the buffalo. At length we reached a little glade in which there grew a stunted old mimosa thorn, with a peculiar and overhanging formation of root, under which a porcupine, or an ant-bear, or some such animal, had hollowed out a wide-lipped hole. About ten or fifteen paces from this thorn-tree there was a thick patch of bush. "'See, Mekumazan, see,' said Mashune, excitedly, as we drew near the thorn. "'The buffalo has charged him. Look, here he stood to fire at him. See how firmly he planteth his feet upon the earth. There is the mark of the crooked toe. Hans had a bent toe. Look, here the bull came like a boulder, down the hill, his hoofs turning up the earth like a hoe. Hans had hit him. He bled as he came. There are the blood spots. It is all written down there, my father, upon the earth. Yes, I said, yes. But where is Hans? Even as I said it, Mashune clutched my arm and pointed to the stunted thorn just by us. Even now, gentlemen, it makes me feel sick when I think of what I saw. For fixed in a stout fork of the tree some eight feet from the ground was Hans himself, or rather his dead body, evidently tossed there by the furious buffalo. One leg was twisted round the fork, probably in a dying convulsion. In the side, just beneath the ribs, was a great hole, from which the entrails protruded. But this was not all. The other leg hung down to within five feet of the ground. The skin and most of the flesh were gone from it. For a moment we stood aghast, and gazed at this horrifying sight. Then I understood what had happened. The buffalo, with that devilish cruelty which distinguishes the animal, had— after his enemy was dead, stood underneath his body and licked the flesh off the pendant leg with his file-like tongue. I had heard of such things before, but had always treated the stories as hunter's yarns. But I had no doubt about it now. Poor Hans' skeleton foot and ankle were an ample proof. We stood aghast under the tree and stared and stared at this awful sight, when suddenly our cogitations were interrupted in a painful manner. The thick bush about fifteen paces off burst asunder with a crashing sound, and uttering a series of ferocious pig-like grunts, the bull-buffalo himself came charging out straight at us. Even as he came I saw the blood mark on his side where poor Hans' bullet had struck him. But also, as is often the case with particularly savage buffaloes, that his flanks had recently been terribly torn in an encounter with a lion. On he came, 
his head well up a buffalo does not generally lower his head till he does so to strike those great black horns as i look at them before me gentlemen i seem to see them charging at me as i did ten years ago silhouetted against the green bush behind on on with a shout mashune bolted off sideways toward the bush i had instinctively lifted my eight bore which i had in my hand it would have been useless to fire at the buffalo's head for the dense horns must have turned the bullet but as mashune bolted the bull slowed a little with the momentary idea of following him and as this gave me a ghost of a chance i let drive my only cartridge at his shoulder the bullet struck the shoulder blade and smashed it up and then travelled on under the skin into his flank but it did not stop him though for a second he staggered throwing myself on to the ground with the energy of despair i rolled under the shelter of the projecting root of the thorn crushing myself as far into the mouth of the ant-bear hole as i could in a single instant the buffalo was after me kneeling down on his injured knee for one leg that of which i had broken the shoulder was swinging helplessly to and fro he set to work to try and hook me out of the hole with his crooked horn at first he struck at me furiously and it was one of the blows against the base of the tree which splintered the tip of the horn in the way that you see then he grew more cunning and pushed his head as far under the root as possible made long semicircular sweeps at me grunting furiously and blowing saliva and hot steamy breath all over me i was just out of reach of the horn though every stroke by widening the hole and making more room for his head brought it closer to me but every now and again i received heavy blows in the ribs from his muzzle feeling that i was being knocked silly i made an effort and seizing his rough tongue which was hanging from his jaws i twisted it with all my force the great brute bellowed with pain and fury and jerked himself backward so strongly that he dragged me some inches further from the mouth of the hole and again made a sweep at me catching me this time round the shoulder joint and the hook of his horn i felt that it was all up now and began to hollow a he has got me i shouted in mortal terror guaza mashune guaza stab mashune stab one hoist of the great head and out of the hole i came like a periwinkle out of his shell but even as i did so i caught sight of mashune's stalwart from advancing with his bangwan or broad stabbing assegai raised above his head in another quarter of a second i had fallen from the horn and heard the blow of the spear followed by the indescribable sound of steel shearing its way through flesh i had fallen on my back and looking up i saw that the gallant mashune had driven the assegai a foot or more into the carcass of the buffalo, and was turning to fly. Alas! it was too late. Bellowing madly, and spouting blood from mouth and nostrils, the devilish brute was on him, and had thrown him up like a feather, and then gored him twice as he lay. I struggled up with some wild idea of affording help, but before I had gone a step, the buffalo gave one told me, that his hour had come the buffalo's horn had driven a great hole in his right lung and inflicted other injuries i knelt down beside him in the uttermost distress and took his hand is he dead macumazahn he whispered my eyes are blind i cannot see yes he is dead did the black devil hurt thee macumazahn no my poor fellow i am not much hurt Ow, oh, I am glad. Then came a long silence, broken only by the sound of the air whistling through the hole in his lung as he breathed. Macumazahn, art thou there? I cannot feel thee. I am here, Mashune. I die, Macumazahn. 
the world flies around and around. I go. I go out into the dark. Surely, my father, at times and days to come, thou wilt think of Mashune, who stood by thy side when thou killest elephants, as we used, as we used. They were his last words. His brave spirit passed with him. I dragged his body to the hole under the tree, and pushed it in, placing his broad assegai by him, according to the custom of his people, that he might not go defenceless on his long journey. And then, ladies, I am not ashamed to confess. I stood alone there before it, and wept like a woman. End of Hunter Quartermain's Story by H. Ryder Haggard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Deborah Lynn in Northern Michigan, February 2007. Parting Tony and Patchwork by B. P. Shalaber. 7. Are you in favor of the prohibitive law or the license law? asked her opposite neighbor of the relict of P. P., Corporal of the Bloody Eleventh. She carefully weighed the question as though she were selling snuff, and answered, Sometimes I think I am, and then again I think I am not. Her neighbor was perplexed and repeated the question, varying it a little. "'Have you seen the Mrs. Partington Twilight Soap?' she asked. "'Yes,' was the reply. "'Everybody has seen that. But why?' "'Because,' said the dame, "'it has two sides to it, and it is hard to choose between them. "'Now here are my two neighbors, contagious to me on both sides. "'One goes for probation, t'other for licentiousness, "'and I think the best thing for me is to keep nuisance.' "'She meant neutral, of course.' The neighbor admired and smiled while Ike lay on the floor with his legs in the air, trying to balance Mrs. Partington's fancy waiter on his toe. 9. Christmas Ike was made the happy possessor of a fiddle, which he found in the morning near his stocking. "'Has he got a musical bent?' Banfield asked, of whom Mrs. Partington was buying the instrument. "'Bent, indeed,' said she. "'No, he's as straight as an error.' He explained by repeating the question regarding his musical inclination. Yes, she replied, he's dreadfully inclined to music since he had a drum, and I want the fiddle to see if I can't make another pickaninny or an old bull of him. Jew's harps is simple, though I can't see how King David played on one of them and sung his psalms at the same time. But the fiddle is best because genius can show itself plainer on it without much noise. Some prefers a violin. But I don't know. The fiddle was well improved till the horse hair all pulled out of the bow, and it was then twisted up into a fish line. 16. How limpid you walk, said a voice behind us, as we were making a hundred and fifty horsepower effort to reach a table whereon reposed a volume of bacon. What is the cause of your lameness? It was Mrs. Partington's voice that spoke, and Mrs. Partington's eyes that met the glance we returned over our left shoulder. "'Gout,' said we, briefly, almost surlily. "'Dear me,' said she, "'you are highly flavoured. It was only rich people and epicacs in living that had the gout in olden times.' "'Ah!' we growled, partly in response and partly with an infernal twinge. "'Poor soul,' she continued with commiseration, like an anodyne, in the tones of her voice. "'The best remedy I know for it is an embarkation of Roman wormwood and lobelia for the part infected, though some say a cranberry poultice is best, but I believe the cranberries is for erysipelas, and whether either of them is a rostrum for the gout or not, I really don't know. If it was a fraction of the arm, I could just know what to subscribe.' We looked into her eye with the determination to say something severely bitter, because we felt allopathic just then. But the kind and sympathizing look that met our own disarmed severity, 
and sinking into a seat with our coveted bacon, we thanked her. It was very evident, all the while that she, or they, stayed, that Ike was seeing how near he could come to our lame member and not touch it. He did touch it sometimes, but those didn't count. 20. "'I've always noticed,' said Mrs. Partington on New Year's Day, dropping her voice to the key that people adopt when they are disposed to be philosophical or moral. "'I've always noticed that every year added to a man's life is apt to make him older, just as a man who goes a journey finds, as he jogs on, that every mile he goes brings him nearer where he is going and farther from where he started. "'I am not so young as I was once.' and I don't believe I ever shall be if I live to the age of Samson, which heaven knows as well as I do I don't want to, for I wouldn't be a centurion or an octagon and survive my factories and become idiomatic by any means. But then there is no knowing how a thing will turn out till it takes place, and we shall come to an end some day, though we may never live to see it. There was a smart tap on the looking-glass that hung upon the wall, followed instantly by another. "'Gracious!' said she. "'What's that? "'I hope the glass isn't fractioned, "'for it is a sure sign of calamity, "'and mercy knows they come along full fast enough "'without helping them by breaking looking-glasses.' "'There was another tap, "'and she caught sight of a white bean that fell on the floor, "'and there, reflected in the glass, was the face of Ike, "'who was blowing beans at the mirror through a crack in the door. Twenty-one. "'As for the Chinese question,' said Mrs. Partington reflectively, "'holding her spoon at present, while the vapour of her cup of tea "'curled about her face, which shone through it like the moon through a mist. "'It is a great pity that somebody don't answer it, "'though who, under the canister of heaven, can do it, "'with such letters as they have on their tea-chests, "'is more than I can tell. "'It is really too bad, though, that some linguister doesn't try it, and not have this provoking question asked all the time, as if we were ignoramuses, and did not know too long from no strong, and there never was such a thing as the seventh commandment, which heaven knows suits this case to a T, and I hope the breakers of it may escape, but I don't see how they can. The question must be answered, unless it is like a cannon drum to be given up, which nobody of any spirit should do. She brought the spoon down into the cup, and looked out through the windows of her soul into celestial fields peopled with pigtails that were all in her eye, while Ike took a double charge of sugar for his tea and gave an extra allowance of milk to the kitten. End of Partingtonian Patchwork The Third Ingredient by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tomahaw. The so called Vallambrosa apartment house is not an apartment house. It is composed of two old fashioned brownstone front residences welded into one. The parlor floor of one side is gay with the wraps and headgear of a modiste. The other is lugubrious with the sophistical promises and grisly display of a painless dentist. You may have a room there for two dollars a week, or you may have one for twenty dollars. Among the Vallambrosa's rumors are stenographers, musicians, brokers, shop girls, space rate writers, art students, wiretappers, and other people who lean far over the banister rail when the doorbell rings. This treatise shall have to do with but two of the Vallambrosians though meaning no disrespect to the others. At six o'clock one afternoon, Hetty Pepper came back to her third-floor rear $3.50 room in the Vallambrosa with her nose and chin more sharply pointed than usual. To be discharged from the department store where you've been working four years and with only 15 cents in your purse does have a tendency to make your features appear more finely chiseled. And now for Hetty's thumbnail biography while she climbs the two flights of stairs. She walked into the biggest store one morning four years before with 75 other girls applying for a job behind the waste department counter. 
The phalanx of wage earners formed a bewildering scene of beauty, carrying a total mass of blonde hair sufficient to have justified the horseback gallops of a hundred Lady Godivas. The capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man, whose task it was to engage six of the contestants, was aware of a feeling of suffocation, as if he were drowning in a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, hand-embroidered, floated about him. And then a sail hove into sight. Hetty Pepper, homely of countenance, with small, contemptuous green eyes and chocolate-colored hair, dressed in a suit of plain burlap and a common-sense hat, stood before him with every one of her twenty-nine years of life unmistakably in sight. "'You're on!' shouted the bald-headed young man, and was saved. And that is how Hetty came to be employed in the biggest store. The story of her rise to an eight-dollar-a-week salary is the combined stories of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. You shall not learn from me the salary that was paid her as a beginner. There is a sentiment growing about such things, and I want no millionaire store proprietors climbing the fire escape of my tenement house to throw dynamite bombs into my skylight boudoir. The story of Hetty's discharge from the biggest store is so nearly a repetition of her engagement as to be monotonous. In each department of the store there is an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnivorous person carrying always a mileage book and a red necktie, and referred to as a buyer. The destinies of the girls in his department who live on, see Bureau of Victual Statistics, so much per week are in his hands. This particular buyer was a capable, cool-eyed, impersonal, young, bald-headed man. As he walked along the aisles of his department, he seemed to be sailing on a sea of frangipani, while white clouds, machine-embroidered, floated around him. Too many sweets bring surfeit. He looked upon Hetty Pepper's homely countenance, emerald eyes, and chocolate-colored hair as a welcome oasis of green in a desert of cloying beauty. In a quiet angle of a counter, he pinched her arm kindly, three inches above the elbow. She slapped him three feet away with one good blow of her muscular, and not especially lily-white, right. So now you know why Eddie Pepper came to leave the biggest store at thirty minutes' notice with one dime and a nickel in her purse. This morning's quotations list the price of rib beef at six cents per butcher's pound. But on the day that Hetty was released by the B.S., the price was seven and one-half cents. That fact is what makes this story possible. Otherwise, the extra four cents would have... But the plot of nearly all the good stories in the world is concerned with shorts who were unable to cover, so you can find no fault with this one. Hetty mounted with her rib beef to her $3.50 third floor back. One hot, savory beef stew for supper, a night's good sleep, and she would be fit in the morning to apply again for the tasks of Hercules, Joan of Arc, Una, Job, and Little Red Riding Hood. In her room she got the graniteware stew pan out of the two-by-four-foot china, or I mean earthenware, closet and began to dig down in a rat's nest of paper bags for the potatoes and onions. She came out with her nose and chin just a little sharper pointed. There was neither a potato nor an onion. Now what kind of a beef stew can you make out of simply beef? You can make oyster soup without oysters, turtle soup without turtles, coffee cake without coffee, but you can't make beef stew without potatoes and onions. But rib beef alone, in an emergency, can make an ordinary pine door look like a wrought iron gambling house portal to the wolf. With salt and pepper and a tablespoon of flour, first well stirred in a little cold water, it will serve. Tis not so deep as a lobster a la Newburgh, nor so wide as a church festival donut, but twill serve. Hetty took her stew pan to the rear of the third floor hall. According to the advertisements of the Vallambrosa, there was running water to be found there. Between you, me, and the water meter, it only ambled or walked through the faucets, but technicalities have no place here. There was also a sink where housekeeping rumors often met to dump their coffee grounds and glare at one another's kimonos. 
At this sink, Hetty found a girl with heavy gold-brown artistic hair and plaintive eyes washing two large Irish potatoes. Hetty knew the Vallambrosa as well as anyone not owning double hextra magnifying eyes could compass its mysteries. The kimonos were her, her encyclopedia, her who's what, her clearinghouse of news, of goers and comers. From a rose-pink kimono edged with Nile grain, she had learned that the girl with the potatoes was a miniature painter living in a kind of attic, or studio as they prefer to call it, on the top floor. Hetty was not certain in her mind what a miniature was, but it certainly wasn't a house, because house painters, although they wear splashy overalls and poke ladders in your face on the street, are known to indulge in a riotous profusion of food at home. The potato girl was quite slim and small, and handled her potatoes as an old bachelor uncle handles a baby who is cutting teeth. She had a dull shoemaker's knife in her right hand, and she had begun to peel one of the potatoes with it. Hetty addressed her in the punctiliously formal tone of one who intends to be cheerfully familiar with you in the second round. "'Beg pardon,' she said, "'for butting into what's not my business, but if you peel them potatoes, you lose out. They're new Bermudas. You want to scrape them. Let me show you.' She took a potato and the knife and began to demonstrate. "'Oh, thank you,' breathed the artist. "'I didn't know, and I did hate to see the thick peelings go. It seemed such a waste, but I thought they always had to be peeled. When you've got only potatoes to eat, the peelings count, you know. Say, kid, said Hetty, staying her knife, you ain't up against it, too, are you? The miniature artist smiled starvedly. I suppose I am. Art, or at least the way I interpret it, doesn't seem to be much in demand. I have only these potatoes for my dinner. But they aren't so bad, boiled and hot with a little butter and salt. Child, said Hetty, letting a brief smile soften her rigid, rigid features, fate has sent me and you together. I've had it handed to me in the neck, too, but I've got a chunk of meat in my room as big as a lapdog, and I've done everything to get potatoes except pray for them. Let's me and you bunch our commissary departments and make a stew of them. We'll cook it in my room, if only we had an onion to go with it. Say, kid, you haven't got a couple of pennies that have slipped down into the lining of your last winter sealskin, have you? I could step down to the corner and get one at old Giuseppe's stand. A stew without an onion is worse than a matinee without candy. You may call me Cecilia, said the artist. No, I spent my last penny three days ago. Then we'll have to cut the onion out instead of slicing it in, said Hetty. I'd ask the janitress for one, but I don't want him hip just yet to the fact I'm pounding the asphalt for another job. But I wish we did have an onion. In the shop girl's room, the two began to prepare their supper. Cecilia's part was to sit on the couch helplessly and beg to be allowed to do something, in the voice of a cooing ring dove. Hetty prepared the rib beef, putting it in cold, salted water in the stew pan and setting it on the one burner gas stove. I wish we had an onion, said Hetty, as she scraped the two potatoes. On the wall opposite the couch was pinned a flaming, gorgeous advertising picture of one of the new ferry boats of the PUFF Railroad that had been built to cut down the time between Los Angeles and New York City one-eighth of a minute. Hetty, turning her head during her continuous monologue, saw tears running from her guest's eyes as she gazed on the idealized presentment of the speeding foam-girdled transport. "'Why, say, Cecilia kid,' said Hetty, poising her knife. Is it as bad art as that? I ain't a critic, but I thought it kind of brightened up the room. Of course, a manicure painter could tell it was a bum picture in a minute. I'll take it down if you say so. I wish to the holy Saint Potluck we had an onion. But the miniature miniature painter had tumbled down, sobbing, with her nose indenting the hard-woven drapery of the couch. Something was here deeper than the artistic temperament offended at crude lithography. Hetty knew. She had accepted her role long ago. How scant the words with which we try to describe a single quality of a human being. When we reach the abstract, we are lost. The nearer to nature that the babbling of our lips comes, the better do we understand. Figuratively, let us say, some people are bosoms, some are hands, some are heads, some are muscles, some are feet, some are backs for burdens. Hetty was a shoulder. Hers was a sharp, sinewy shoulder, 
but all her life people had laid their heads upon it, metaphorically or actually, and had left there all or half their troubles. Looking at life anatomically, which is as good a way as any, she was preordained to be a shoulder. There were few truer collarbones anywhere than hers. Hetty was only thirty-three, and she had not yet outlived the little pang that visited her whenever the head of youth and beauty leaned upon her for consolation. But one glance in her mirror always served as an instantaneous painkiller. So she gave one pale look into the crinkly old looking-glass on the wall above the gas stove, turned down the flame a little lower from the bubbling beef and potatoes, went over to the couch, and lifted Cecilia's head to its confessional. "'Go on and tell me, honey,' she said. "'I know now that it ain't art that's worrying you. "'You met him on a ferry boat, didn't you? "'Go on, Cecilia, kid, and tell your, your Aunt Hetty about it. "'But youth and melancholy must first spend the surplus of sighs and tears "'that waft and float the bark of romance to its harbor in the delectable isles.' Presently, through the stringy tendons that formed the bars of the confessional, the penitent, or was it the glorified communicant of the sacred flame, told her story without art or illumination. It was only three days ago. I was coming back on the ferry from Jersey City. Old Mr. Shrum, an art dealer, told me of a rich man in Newark who wanted a miniature of his daughter painted. I went to see him and showed him some of my work. When I told him the price would be fifty dollars, he laughed at me like a hyena. He said an enlarged crayon twenty times the size would cost him only eight dollars. I had just enough money to buy my ferry ticket back to New York. I felt as if I didn't want to live another day. I must have looked as I felt, for I saw him on the row of seats opposite me, looking at me as if he understood. He was nice-looking, but, oh, above everything else, he looked kind. When one is tired or unhappy or hopeless, kindness counts more than anything else. When I got so miserable that I couldn't fight against it any longer, I got up and walked slowly out the rear door of the ferry boat cabin. No one was there, and I slipped quickly over the rail and dropped into the water. Oh, friend Hetty, it was cold, cold. For just one moment I wished I was back in the old Valambrosa, starving and hoping. And then I got numb and didn't care. And then I felt that somebody else was in the water close by me, holding me up. He had followed me and jumped in to save me. Somebody threw a thing like a big white donut at us, and he made me put my arms through the hole. Then the ferry boat backed, and they pulled us on board. Oh, Hetty, I was so ashamed of my wickedness in trying to drown myself. And besides, my hair had all tumbled down and was sopping wet, and I was such a sight. And then some men in blue clothes came around, and he gave them his card, and I heard him tell them he had seen me drop my purse on the edge of the boat outside the rail, and in leaning over to get it I had fallen overboard. And then I remembered having read in the papers that people who try to kill themselves are locked up in cells with people who try to kill other people, and I was afraid. But some ladies on the boat took me downstairs to the furnace room and got me nearly dry and did up my hair. When the boat landed, he came and put me in a cab. He was all dripping himself, but laughed as if he thought it was all a joke. He begged me, but I wouldn't tell him my name nor where I lived. I was so ashamed. You were a fool, child, said Hetty kindly. Wait till I turn the light up a bit. I wish to heaven we had an onion. Then he raised his hat, went on Cecilia, and said, Very well, but I'll find you anyhow. I'm going to claim my rights of salvage. Then he gave money to the cab driver and told him to take me wherever I wanted to go, and walked away. What is salvage, Hetty? The edge of a piece of goods that ain't hemmed, said the shop girl. You must have looked pretty well frazzled out to the little hero boy. It's been three days, moaned the miniature painter, and he hasn't found me yet. Extend the time, said Hetty. This is a big town. Think of how many girls he might have to see soaked in water with their hair down before he would recognize you. 
stew's getting on fine but oh for an onion I'd even use a piece of garlic if I had it the beef and potatoes bubbled merrily exhaling a mouth-watering savor that yet lacked something leaving a hunger on the palate a haunting wistful desire for some lost and needful ingredient I came near drowning in that awful river said Cecilia shuddering it ought to have more water in it said Hetty the stew I mean I'll go get some at the sink it smells good said the artist that nasty old North River objected Hetty smells to me like soap factories and wet setter dogs oh you mean the stew well I wish we had an onion for it did he look like he had money first he looked kind said Cecilia I'm sure he was rich but that matters so little when he drew out his bill folder to pay the cabman you couldn't help seeing hundreds and thousands of dollars in it and I looked over the cab doors and saw him leave the ferry station in a motor car and the chauffeur gave him his bearskin to put on for he was sopping wet and it was only three days ago what a fool said Hetty shortly oh the chauffeur wasn't wet breathed Cecilia and he drove the car away very nicely I mean you said Hetty for not giving him your address I never give my address to chauffeurs said Cecilia haughtily I wish we had one said Hetty disconsolately what for for the stew of course oh I mean an onion Hetty took a pitcher and started to the sink at the end of the hall a young man came down the stairs from above just as she was opposite the lower step he was decently dressed but pale and haggard his eyes were dull with the stress of some burden of physical or mental woe in his hand he bore an onion a pink smooth solid shining onion as large around as a 98 cent alarm clock Hetty stopped so did the young man there was something Joan of Arkish, Herculean, and Una-ish in the look and pose of the shop lady. She had cast off the roles of Job and Little Red Riding Hood. The young man stopped at the foot of the stairs and coughed distractedly. He felt marooned, held up, attacked, assailed, levied upon, sacked, assessed, panhandled, browbeaten, though he knew not why. It was the look in Hetty's eyes that did it. In them he saw the Jolly Roger fly to the masthead, and an able seaman with a dirk between his teeth scurry up the rat lines and nail it there. But as yet he did not know that the cargo he carried was the thing that had caused him to be so nearly blown out of the water without even a parley. "'Beg your pardon,' said Hetty, as sweetly as her dilute acidic acid tones permitted. "'But did you find that onion on the stairs? There was, there was a hole in the paper bag, and I've just come out to look for it.' The young man coughed for half a minute. The interval may have given him the courage to defend his own property. Also, he clutched his pungent prize greedily, and with a show of spirit faced his grim waylayer no he said huskily I didn't find it on the stairs it was given to me by Jack Bevins on the top floor if you don't believe it ask him I'll wait until you do I know about Bevins said Hetty sourly he writes books and things up there for the paper and rags man we can hear the postman guy him all over the house when he brings them thick envelopes back say do you live in the Vallambrosa I do not said the young man I come to see Bevins sometimes. He's my friend. I live two blocks west. What are you going to do with the onion? Begging your pardon, said Hetty. I'm going to eat it. Raw? Yes, as soon as I get home. Haven't you got anything else to eat with it? The young man considered briefly. No, he confessed. There's not another scrap of anything in my diggings to eat. I think old Jack is pretty hard up for grub in his shack, too. He hated to give up the onion, but I worried him into parting with it. Man, said Hetty, fixing him with her world sapient eyes and laying a bony but impressive finger on his sleeve. You've known trouble, too, haven't you? Lots, said the onion owner, promptly. But this onion is my own property, honestly come by. If you will excuse me, I must be going. 
Listen, said Hetty, paling a little with anxiety. Raw onion is a mighty poor diet, and so is beef stew without one. Now, if you're Jack Bevan's friend, I guess you're nearly right. There's a little lady, a friend of mine, in my room there at the end of the hall. Both of us are out of luck, and we just have potatoes and meat between us. They're stewing now, but it ain't got any soul. There's something lacking to it. There's certain things in life that are naturally intended to fit and belong together. One is pink cheesecloth and green roses, and one is ham and eggs, and one is Irish and trouble, and the other is beef and potatoes with onions, and still another is people who are up against it and other people in the same fix. The young man went into a protracted paroxysm of coughing. With one hand he hugged his onion to his bosom. No doubt, no doubt, said he at length. But as I said, I must be going, because Hetty clutched his sleeve firmly. Don't be a dago, little brother. Don't eat raw onions. Chip it in towards the dinner, and line yourself inside with the best stew you ever licked a spoon over. Must two ladies knock a gentleman down and drag him inside for the honor of dining with him? No harm shall befall you, little brother. Loosen up and fall into line. The young man's pale face relaxed into a grin. Believe I'll go, you see, he said, brightening, if my onion is good as a credential. I'll accept the invitation gladly. It's good as that, but better as seasoning, said Hetty. You come and stand outside the door till I ask my lady friend if she has any objections, and don't run away with that letter of recommendation before I come out. Hetty went into her room and closed the door. The young man waited outside. Cecilia, kid, said the shop girl, oiling the sharp saw of her voice as well as she could. There's an onion outside, with a young man attached. I've asked him in to dinner. You ain't going to kick, are you? Oh, dear, said Cecilia, sitting up and patting her artistic hair. She cast a mournful glance at the ferry boat poster on the wall. Nit, said Hetty, it ain't him. You're up against real life now. I believe you said your hero friend had money and automobiles. This is a poor skeezix that's got nothing to eat but an onion. But he's easy-spoken and not a freshy. I imagine he's been a gentleman. He's so low down now. And we need the onion. Shall I bring him in? I'll guarantee his behavior. Hetty, dear, sighed Cecilia. I'm so hungry. What difference does it make whether he's a prince or a burglar? I don't care. Bring him in if he's got anything to eat with him. Hetty went back into the hall. The onion man was gone. Her heart missed a beat, and a gray look settled over her face except on her nose and cheekbones. And then the tides of life flowed in again, for she saw him leaning out of the front window at the other end of the hall. She hurried there. He was shouting to someone below. The noise of the street overpowered the sound of her footsteps. She looked down over his shoulder, saw whom he was speaking to, and heard his words. He pulled himself in from the window sill and saw her standing over him. Hetty's eyes bored into him like two steel gimlets. Don't lie to me, she said calmly. What were you going to do with that onion? The young man suppressed a cough and faced her resolutely. His manner was that of one who had been bearded sufficiently. I was going to eat it, said he with emphatic slowness, just as I told you before. And you have nothing else to eat at home? Not a thing. What kind of work do you do? I am not working at anything just now. Then why, said Hetty, with her voice set on its sharpest edge, do you lean out of windows and give orders to chauffeurs in green automobiles in the street below? The young man flushed, and his dull eyes began to sparkle. Because, madam, said he, in accelerando tones, I pay the chauffeur's wages, and I own the automobile, and also this onion, this onion, madam. He flourished the onion within an inch of Hetty's nose. The shop lady did not retreat a hair's breadth. Then why do you eat 
onions, she said with biting contempt, and nothing else. I never said I did, retorted the young man heatedly. I said I had nothing else to eat where I live. I am not a delicatessen storekeeper. Then why, pursued Hetty inflexibly, were you going to eat a raw onion? My mother, said the young man, always made me eat one for a cold. Pardon my referring to a physical infirmity, but you may have noticed that I have a very, very severe cold. I was going to eat the onion and go to bed. I wonder why I am standing here and apologizing to you for it. How did you catch this cold? went on Hetty suspiciously. The young man seemed to have arrived at some extreme height of feeling. There were two modes of descent open to him, a burst of rage or a surrender to the ridiculous. He chose wisely, and the empty hall echoed his hoarse laughter. You're a dandy, said he, and I don't blame you for being careful. I don't mind telling you. I got wet. I was on a north ferry a few days ago when a girl jumped overboard. Of course I... And he extended her hand, interrupting his story. Give me the onion, she said. The young man set his jaw a trifle harder. Give me the onion, she repeated. He grinned and laid it in her hand. Then Hetty's infrequent, grim, melancholy smile showed itself. She took the young man's arm and pointed with her other hand to the door of her room. Little brother, she said, go in there. The little fool you fished out of the river is there waiting for you. Go on in. I'll give you three minutes before I come. Potatoes is in there, waiting. Go on in, onions. After he tapped at the door and entered, Hetty began to peel and wash the onion at the sink. She gave a gray look at the gray roofs outside, and the smile on her face vanished by little jerks and twitches. But it's us, she said grimly to herself. It's us that furnished the beef. End of The Third Ingredient by O. Henry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Deborah Lynn in Northern Michigan, February 2007. The Unrest Cure by Saki on the rack in the railway carriage, immediately opposite Clovis, was a solidly wrought travelling bag, with a carefully written label on which was inscribed, J. P. Huddle, The Warren, Tilfield near Slowborough. Immediately below the rack sat the human embodiment of the label, a solid, sedate individual, sedately dressed, sedately conversational. Even without his conversation, which was addressed to a friend seated by his side, and touched chiefly on such topics as the backwardness of Roman hyacinths and the prevalence of measles at the rectory, one could have gauged fairly accurately the temperament and mental outlook of the travelling bag's owner. But he seemed unwilling to leave anything to the imagination of a casual observer, and his talk grew presently personal and introspective. "'I don't know how it is,' told his friend. I'm not much over forty, but I seem to have settled down into a deep groove of elderly middle age. My sister shows the same tendency. We like everything to be exactly in its accustomed place. We like things to happen exactly at their appointed times. We like everything to be usual, orderly, punctual, methodical to a hair's breadth, to a minute. It distresses and upsets us if it is not so. For instance, to take a very trifling matter, a thrush has built its nest year after year in the catkin tree on the lawn. This year, for no obvious reason, it is building in the ivy on the garden wall. 
We have said very little about it, but I think we both feel that the change is unnecessary and just a little irritating. Perhaps, said the friend, it is a different thrush. We have suspected that, said J. P. Huddle, and I think it gives us even more cause for annoyance. We don't feel that we want a change of thrush at our time of life, and yet, as I have said, we have scarcely reached an age when these things should make themselves seriously felt. What you want, said the friend, is an unrest cure. An unrest cure? I've never heard of such a thing. You've heard of rest cures for people who've broken down under stress of too much worry and strenuous living. Well, you're suffering from overmuch repose and placidity, and you need the opposite kind of treatment. But where would one go for such a thing? Well, you might stand as an orange candidate for Kilkenny, or do a course of district visiting in one of the Apache quarters of Paris, or give lectures in Berlin to prove that most of Wagner's music was written by Gambetta. "'and there's always the interior of Morocco to travel in. "'But to be really effective, the unrest cure ought to be tried in the home. "'How you would do it, I haven't the faintest idea.' "'It was at this point in the conversation that Clovis became galvanized into alert attention. "'After all, his two days' visit to an elderly relative at Slowborough did not promise much excitement. "'Before the train had stopped,' He had decorated his sinister shirt-cuff with the inscription, J. P. Huddle, the Warren, Tilfield, near Slowborough. Two mornings later Mr. Huddle broke in on his sister's privacy as she sat reading Country Life in the morning-room. It was her day and hour and place for reading Country Life, and the intrusion was absolutely irregular. But he bore in his hand a telegram and in that household telegrams were recognized as happening by the hand of God. This particular telegram partook of the nature of a thunderbolt. Bishop examining confirmation class in neighborhood, unable stay rectory, on account measles, invokes your hospitality, sending secretary arrange. I scarcely know the bishop. I've only spoken to him once exclaimed J. P. Huddle, with the exculpating air of one who realizes too late the indiscretion of speaking to strange bishops. Miss Huddle was the first to rally. She disliked thunderbolts as fervently as her brother did, but the womanly instinct in her told her that thunderbolts must be fed. "'We can curry the cold duck,' she said. It was not the appointed day for curry, but the little orange envelope involved a certain departure from rule and custom." Her brother said nothing, but his eyes thanked her for being brave. "'A young gentleman to see you,' announced the parlour-maid. "'The secretary,' murmured the huddles in unison. They instantly stiffened into a demeanour which proclaimed that, though they held all strangers to be guilty, they were willing to hear anything they might have to say in their defence. The young gentleman, who came into the room with a certain elegant haughtiness, was not at all Huddle's idea of a bishop's secretary. He had not supposed that the Episcopal establishment could have afforded such an expensively upholstered article when there were so many other claims on its resources. The face was fleetingly familiar. If he had bestowed more attention on the fellow traveller sitting opposite him in the railway carriage two days before, he might have recognised Clovis in his present visitor. "'You are the bishop's secretary?' asked Huddle, becoming consciously deferential. "'His confidential secretary,' answered Clovis. "'You may call me Stanislaus. My other name doesn't matter. "'The bishop and Colonel Alberti may be here to lunch. I shall be here in any case.' "'It sounded rather like the programme of a royal visit. "'The bishop is examining a confirmation class in the neighbourhood, isn't he?' asked Miss Huddle. "'Ostensibly.' was the dark reply, followed by a request for a large-scale map of the locality. Clovis was still immersed in a seemingly profound study of the map when another telegram arrived. It was addressed to Prince Stanislaus, care of Huddle, the Warren, etc. Clovis glanced at the contents and announced, "'The Bishop and Alberti won't be here till late in the afternoon.' Then he returned to his scrutiny of the map. The luncheon was not a very festive function. The princely secretary ate and drank with fair appetite, 
but severely discouraged conversation. At the finish of the meal he broke suddenly into a radiant smile, thanked his hostess for a charming repast, and kissed her hand with deferential rapture. Miss Huddle was unable to decide in her mind whether the action savoured of Louis Quatorzian courtliness or the reprehensible Roman attitude towards the Sabine women. It was not her day for having a headache, but she felt that the circumstances excused her, and retired to her room to have as much headache as was possible before the bishop's arrival. Clovis, having asked the way to the nearest telegraph office, disappeared presently down the carriage drive. Mr. Huddle met him in the hall some two hours later, and asked when the bishop would arrive. "'He is in the library with Alberti,' was the reply. "'But why wasn't I told? I never knew he had come!' exclaimed Huddle. "'No one knows he is here,' said Clovis. "'The quieter we can keep matters, the better. And on no account disturb him in the library. Those are his orders.' "'But what is all this mystery about? And who is Alberti? And isn't the bishop going to have tea?' "'The bishop is out for blood, not tea.' "'Blood?' gasped Huddle, who did not find that the thunderbolt improved on acquaintance. "'Tonight is going to be a great night in the history of Christendom,' said Clovis. "'We are going to massacre every Jew in the neighborhood.' "'To massacre the Jews!' said Huddle indignantly. "'Do you mean to tell me there's a general rising against them?' "'No, it's the bishop's own idea.' He's in there arranging all the details now. But the bishop is such a tolerant, humane man. That is precisely what will heighten the effect of his action. The sensation will be enormous. That, at least, Huddle could believe. He will be hanged, he exclaimed with conviction. A motor is waiting to carry him to the coast where a steam yacht is in readiness. But there aren't thirty Jews in the whole neighborhood, protested Huddle whose brain, under the repeated shocks of the day, was operating with the uncertainty of a telegraph wire during earthquake disturbances. "'We have twenty-six on our list,' said Clovis, referring to a bundle of notes. "'We shall be able to deal with them all the more thoroughly.' "'Do you mean to tell me that you are meditating violence against a man like Sir Leon Burberry?' stammered Huddle. "'He's one of the most respected men in the country.' "'He's down on our list,' said Clovis carelessly. "'After all, we've got men we can trust to do our job, "'so we shan't have to rely on local assistance, "'and we've got some Boy Scouts helping us as auxiliaries.' "'Boy Scouts?' "'Yes. When they understood there was real killing to be done, "'they were even keener than the men. "'This thing will be a blot on the twentieth century. "'And your house will be the blotting pad. "'Have you realized that half the papers of Europe and the United States "'will publish pictures of it?' "'By the way, I've sent some photographs of you and your sister "'that I found in the library to the Mateen and I wash. "'I hope you won't mind. "'Also a sketch of the staircase. "'Most of the killing will probably be done on the staircase.' "'The emotions that were surging in J.P. Huddle's brain "'were almost too intense to be disclosed in speech. "'But he managed to gasp out, "'There aren't any Jews in this house.' "'Not at present,' said Clovis.' "'I shall go to the police,' shouted Huddle, with sudden energy. "'In the shrubbery,' said Clovis, "'are posted ten men who have orders to fire on anyone who leaves the house "'without my signal of permission. "'Another armed piquette is in ambush near the front gate. "'The Boy Scouts watch the back premises.' "'At this moment the cheerful hoot of a motor-horn was heard from the drive.' Huddle rushed to the hall-door with the feeling of a man half awakened from a nightmare, and beheld Sir Leon Burberry, who had driven himself over in his car. "'I got your telegram,' he said. "'What's up?' "'Telegram? It seemed to be a day of telegrams.' "'Come here at once. Urgent. James Huddle,' was the purport of the message displayed before Huddle's bewildered eyes. "'I see it all.' he exclaimed suddenly in a voice shaken with agitation, and with a look of agony in the direction of the shrubbery, he hauled the astonished Burberry into the house. Tea had just been laid in the hall, but the now thoroughly panic-stricken Huddle dragged his protesting guest upstairs, and in a few minutes' time the entire household had been summoned to that region of momentary safety. 
Clovis alone graced the tea-table with his presence. The fanatics in the library were evidently too immersed in their monstrous machinations to dally with the solace of teacup and hot toast. Once the youth rose in answer to the summons of the front door bell and admitted Mr. Paul Isaacs, shoemaker and parish councillor, who had also received a pressing invitation to the Warren. With an atrocious assumption of courtesy, which a Borgia could hardly have outdone, the secretary escorted this new captive of his net to the head of the stairway where his involuntary host awaited him. And then ensued a long, ghastly vigil of watching and waiting. Once or twice Clovis left the house to stroll across to the shrubbery, returning always to the library for the purpose, evidently, of making a brief report. Once he took in the letters from the evening postman, and brought them to the top of the stairs with punctilious politeness. After his next absence, he came halfway up the stairs to make an announcement. "'The Boy Scouts mistook my signal and have killed the postman. I've had very little practice in that sort of thing, you see. Another time I shall do better.' The housemaid, who was engaged to be married to the evening postman, gave way to clamorous grief. "'Remember that your mistress has a headache,' said J. P. Huddle. Miss Huddle's headache was worse. Clovis hastened downstairs, and after a short visit to the library, returned with another message. "'The bishop is sorry to hear that Miss Huddle has a headache. He is issuing orders that, as far as possible, no firearms should be used near the house. Any killing that is necessary on the premises will be done with cold steel.' The bishop does not see why a man should not be a gentleman as well as a Christian. That was the last they saw of Clovis. It was nearly seven o'clock, and his elderly relative liked him to dress for dinner. But though he had left them forever, the lurking suggestion of his presence haunted the lower regions of the house during the long hours of the wakeful night, and every creak of the stairway, every rustle of wind through the shrubbery, was fraught with horrible meaning. At about seven next morning, the gardener's boy and the early postman finally convinced the watchers that the twentieth century was still unblotted. "'I don't suppose,' mused Clovis, as an early train bore him townwards, "'that they will be in the least grateful for the unrest cure.'" End of The Unrest Cure by Saki This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by William Kuhn, February 2007. When Papa Swore in Hindustani by P. G. Woodhouse. Sylvia! Yes, Papa. That infernal dog of yours. Oh, Papa. Yes, that infernal dog of yours has been at my carnations again. Colonel Reynolds, V.C., glared sternly across the table at Miss Sylvia Reynolds, and Miss Sylvia Reynolds looked in a deprecatory manner back at Colonel Reynolds, V.C., while the dog in question, a foppish pug, happened to meet the Colonel's eye in transit crawled unostentatiously under the sideboard, and began to rustle with a bad conscience. "'Oh, naughty Tommy,' said Miss Reynolds mildly, in the direction of the sideboard. "'Yes, my dear,' assented the Colonel. "'And if you could convey to him the information that if he does it once more, yes, just once more, I shall shoot him on the spot, you would be doing him a kindness.' and the colonel bit a large crescent out of his toast, with all the energy and conviction of a man who has thoroughly made up his mind. "'At six o'clock this morning,' continued he, in a voice of gentle melancholy, "'I happened to look out of my bedroom window and saw him. He had then destroyed two of my best plants, and was commencing on a third with every appearance of self-satisfaction. I threw two large brushes and a boot at him.' "'Oh, Papa, they didn't hit him.' "'No, my dear, they did not. "'The brushes missed him by several yards, "'and the boot smashed a fourth carnation. 
However, I was so fortunate as to attract his attention, and he left off. I can't think what makes him do it. I suppose it's bones. He's got bones buried all over the garden. Well, if he does it again, you'll find that there will be a few more bones buried in the garden, said the colonel grimly, and he subsided into his paper. Sylvia loved the dog partly for its own sake, but primarily for that of the giver, one Reginald Dallas, whom it had struck at an early period of their acquaintance that he and Miss Sylvia Reynolds were made for one another. On communicating this discovery to Sylvia herself, he had found that her views upon the subject were identical with his own, and all would have gone well had it not been for a melancholy accident. One day, while out shooting with the colonel, with whom he was doing his best to ingratiate himself, with a view to obtaining his consent to the match, he had allowed his sporting instincts to carry him away to such a degree that, in sporting parlance, he wiped his eye badly. Now the colonel prided himself with justice on his powers as a shot, but on this particular day he had a touch of liver, which resulted in his shooting over the birds and under the birds and on each side of the birds, but very rarely at the birds. Dallas being in especially good form, it was found, when the bag came to be counted, that while he had shot seventy brace, the colonel had only managed to secure five and a half. His bad marksmanship destroyed the last remnant of his temper. He swore for half an hour in Hindustani, and for another half hour in English. After that he felt better, and when, at the end of dinner, Sylvia came to him with the absurd request that she might marry Mr. Reginald Dallas, he did not have a fit, but merely signified, in fairly moderate terms, his entire and absolute refusal to think of such a thing. This happened a month before, and the pug, which had changed hands in the earlier days of the friendship, still remained, at the imminent risk of its life, to soothe Sylvia and madden her father. It was generally felt that the way to find favor in the eyes of Sylvia, which were a charming blue, and well worth finding favor in, was to show an intelligent and affectionate interest in her dog. This was so up to a certain point, but no farther, for the mournful recollection of Mr. Dallas prevented her from meeting their advances in quite the spirit they could have wished. However, they persevered, and scarcely a week went by in which Thomas was not rescued from an artfully arranged horrible fate by somebody. But all their energy was in reality wasted, for Sylvia remembered her faithful Reggie, who corresponded vigorously every day, and refused to be put off with worthless imitations. The lovesick swains, however, could not be expected to know this, and the rescuing of Tommy proceeded briskly, now one, now another, playing the role of hero. The very day after the conversation above recorded had taken place, a terrible tragedy occurred. The colonel, returning from a poor day's shooting, observed through the mist that was beginning to rise a small form busily engaged in excavating in the precious carnation bed. Slipping in a cartridge, he fired, and the skill which had deserted him during the day came back to him. There was a yelp, then silence. And Sylvia, rushing out from the house, found the luckless Thomas breathing his last on a heap of uprooted carnations. The news was not long in spreading. The cook told the postman, and the postman thoughtfully handed it on to the servants at the rest of the houses on his round. By noon it was public property, and in the afternoon, at various times from two to five, nineteen young men were struck, quite independently of one another, with a brilliant idea. The results of this idea were apparent on the following day. "'Is that all?' asked the colonel of the servant, as she brought in a couple of letters at breakfast time. "'There's a hamper for Miss Sylvia, sir.' "'A hamper, is there? Well, bring it in.' "'If you please, sir, there are several of them.' "'What? Several? How many are there?' Nineteen, sir,' said Mary, restraining with some difficulty and inclination to giggle. "'Eh, what? Nineteen? Nonsense!' Where are they? We've put them in the coach house for the present, sir. And if you please, sir, Cook says she thinks there's something alive in them. Something alive? Yes, sir. 
and John says he thinks it's dogs, sir. The colonel uttered a sound that was almost a bark, and, followed by Sylvia, rushed to the coach-house. There, sure enough, as far as the eye could reach, were the hampers, and as they looked a sound proceeded from one of them that was unmistakably the plaintive note of a dog that had been shut up, and is getting tired of it. Instantly the other eighteen hampers joined in, until the whole coach-house rang with the noise. The colonel subsided against a wall, and began to express himself softly in Hindustani. "'Poor dears,' said Sylvia, "'how stuffy they must be feeling!' She ran to the house, and returned with a basin of water. "'Poor dears,' she said again, "'you'll soon have something to drink.' She knelt down by the nearest hamper, and cut the cord that fastened it. A pug jumped out like a jack-in-the-box and rushed to the water. Sylvia continued her work of mercy, and by the time the colonel had recovered sufficiently to be able to express his views in English, eighteen more pugs had joined their companion. "'Get out, you brute!' shouted the colonel, as a dog insinuated itself between his legs. "'Sylvia, put them back again this minute. You had no business to let them out. Put them back!' "'But I can't, papa.' I can't catch them. She looked helplessly from him to the seething mass of dogs and back again. Where's my gun? began the colonel. Papa, don't. You couldn't be so cruel. They aren't doing any harm, poor things. If I knew who sent them... Perhaps there's something to show. Yes, here's a visiting card in this hamper. Whose is it? bellowed the colonel through the din. J. Darcy Henderson, the furs, read Sylvia at the top of her voice. Young blackguard, bawled the colonel. I expect there's one in each of the hampers. Yes, here's another. W. K. Ross, the elms. The colonel came across and began to examine the hampers with his own hand. Each hamper contained a visiting card, and each card bore the name of a neighbor. The colonel returned to the breakfast-room, and laid the nineteen cards out in a row on the table. "'Hm,' he said at last. "'Mr. Reginald Dallas does not seem to be represented.' Sylvia said nothing. "'No, he seems not to be represented. I did not give him credit for so much sense.' Then he dropped the subject, and breakfast proceeded in silence. A young gentleman met the colonel on his walk that morning. "'Morning, Colonel,' said he. "'Good morning,' said the Colonel grimly. Uh, "'Colonel, I suppose Miss Reynolds got that dog all right?' "'To which dog do you refer?' "'It was a pug, you know. It ought to have arrived by this time.' "'Yes, I am inclined to think it has. Had it any special characteristics?' "'No, I don't think so. Just an ordinary pug.' "'Well, young man, if you will go to my coach-house, you will find nineteen ordinary pugs, and if you would kindly select your beast and shoot it, I should be much obliged.' Nineteen, said the other in astonishment. "'Why, are you setting up as a dog-fancier in your old age, Colonel?' This was too much for the Colonel. He exploded. "'Old age! Confound your impudence! Dog-fancier!' No, sir, I have not become a dog fancier in what you are pleased to call my old age. But while there is no law to prevent a lot of dashed young puppies like yourself, sir, like yourself, sending your confounded pug dogs to my daughter, who ought to have known better than to have them let out of their dashed hampers, I have no defense. Dog fancier, gad! Unless those dogs are removed by this time tomorrow, sir, they will go straight to the Battersea home, where I devoutly trust they will poison them. Here are the cards of the other gentlemen who were kind enough to think that I might wish to set up for a dog fancier in my old age. Perhaps you will kindly return them to their owners, and tell them what I have just said. And he strode off, leaving the young man in a species of trance. Sylvia, said the colonel on arriving home. Yes, papa. Do you still want to marry that Dallas fellow? Now, for heaven's sake, don't start crying. Goodness knows I've been worried enough this morning without that. Please answer a plain question in a fairly sane manner. Do you or do you not? Of course I do, Papa. Then you may. 
He is the furthest from being a fool of any of the young puppies who live about here, and he knows one end of a gun from the other. I'll write to him now. Dear Dallas, wrote the colonel, I find, on consideration, that you are the only sensible person in the neighborhood. I hope you will come to lunch today, and if you still want to marry my daughter, you may. To which Dallas replied by return of messenger, Thanks for both invitations. I will. An hour later he arrived in person, and the course of true love pulled itself together and began to run smooth again. End of When Papa Swore in Hindustani by P. G. Woodhouse